Welcome to the full story series where we take some of our older videos and combine them into one giant epic, an audio drama for the ages. Today we're going to be telling you the story of Dark Side War, which was broken up into a couple of tie-ins. So the way that this one's going to work is we're going to give you the beginning of Dark Side War. We're then going to lead to when the Justice League became the gods, which is what they become in this. So then we'll do all of their individual tie-ins, and then we're going to conclude Dark Side War. But we're not going to end there. Following that, we're going to show you the journey of Dark Side, because all of that is basically the epilogue to Dark Side War. So this contains. Dark Side War, the Dark Side War tie-ins, and the epilogue to the entire Dark Side War. I hope you guys enjoy. If you're wondering where you are, this is Comic Storian. We like to take the lore of comic books, video games, and movies and break them down into audio dramas, allowing you to keep up with your favorite storylines on your busy day. Enjoy. Our tale begins with a man working his way into the deep depths of Apocalypse the home of Darkseid and his army. The man's name is Scott Bree, and he was from New Genesis, the home of the New Gods. But when he was seven, the children of the High Father and Darkseid were exchanged in an effort to broker peace. It didn't work, and Scott was thrown into the slave pits where he was forgotten. Years passed, but eventually, he learned to pick the lock and set himself free, and slowly but surely, he worked his way around Apocalypse. Until eventually, he was able to break away completely and get himself to Earth, where he took the name Scott Free, and he now goes by the superhero name, Mr. Miracle. But that's where he started, not where he is now. He's breaking into Darkseid's vaults to steal himself a mother box, because rumors have been started that Darkseid is preparing for a war. He's been making more parademons from the poor souls of every world that he's conquered in the entire multiverse. And in order to stop him, Mr. Miracle will need the help of one group. The one group that has been able to stop him. The Justice League. The Justice League, though, they've been dealing with a few changes recently. While they still have Superman, Batman, Flash, Green Lantern, Cyborg, and Wonder Woman, there are now a few new members of the roster ever since the events of Forever Evil and the Amazo Virus. There is an individual called Power Ring that is using the evil Green Lantern ring from Earth-3 for good as a member of the Justice League now. And Lex Luthor and Captain Cold have both been invited onto the Justice League more because of a PR situation than anything, but ever since the event of Forever Evil. They are also now working closely with Colonel Trevor, and Shazam is officially a member of the team now. Flash, Batman, Shazam, Cyborg, Wonder Woman, and Colonel Trevor are all investigating an odd string of murders. All women with the name Myrina Black and the killers have all vanished into thin air. Meanwhile, Superman and Lex Luthor are making their way into Lex Luthor's bunker to check on the status of Neutron after the events of the Amazo virus. Ever since they stopped him, cancer has slowly been killing the man, and Luthor doesn't think that there is anything he can do to save him. So, Superman challenges Lex Luthor to cure cancer, and Captain Cold snickers because he gets to watch Lex Luthor take that challenge. Back on Apocalypse, Mr. Miracle is looking for a woman that Darkseid has his soldiers looking for, by the name of Myrina Black. When Darkseid himself appears, they stare at each other, and Mr. Miracle throws a disc at Darkseid that doesn't even throw him off his footing. Darkseid's eyes then begin to fill with power as he fires his eye beams at Mr. Miracle, destroying the ground that he was standing on, knocking Mr. Miracle over. Then Darkseid walks over and places a single boot onto Mr. Miracle's entire body. So Scott struggles to reach out for the mother box that he came here for, and he tells it, Mother box, get me out of here! And then, boom! He's gone, and Darkseid walks away, not even phased by this. But this is only the beginning, as the Flash is talking to Power Ring, when suddenly, he stops, because someone is climbing out of his mouth, boom tubing onto the earth through the Flash's body. The woman stands over him, declaring, First blood. And then everyone can see her, draped in dark side symbols and colors. And she looks at Batman, realizing that he is a threat, even without powers. So she decides that she's going to get the drop on him, and leaps over him, striking him in the exact locations to take him out of the fight. Then, as Cyborg fires a beam at her, she sees the technology of the mother box inside of him, and demands it! She shoves him to the ground and begins tearing off pieces of his armor and throwing them aside before she's hit by Shazam. Shazam then runs over to Cyborg's aid, but she grabs Shazam by the head and stabs him through the stomach. But before she can finish Shazam off, Wonder Woman grabs her from behind with a lasso, demanding to know who she is. 
The woman manages to get free, so Wonder Woman calls up Superman, telling him that the League is under attack. And she has no idea who this is because the lasso didn't work. But the woman overhears and tells her, It is no secret. I am an Amazon and I'm completing the mission that we were created for. With that statement, she hits Wonder Woman's braces with the full power of her eye beams shattering them before tackling Wonder Woman and bringing her to the ground. Back in the bunker with Lex Luthor and Superman, Lex brings Superman into his armory where he has a new power suit entirely powered by kryptonite. If Wonder Woman's in trouble, he's gonna need it. But Superman takes that as another secret evil plan that Lex Luthor has and he tells him, between this and the Amazo virus, the League is done with you, Lex. So Lex turns on Superman, hitting him with a blast of power from his suit, telling him, who are you to decide? And then someone shoots Lex Luthor, and he falls into Superman's arms, as Superman sees the shooter is Lena Luthor, Lex's sister. Don't be surprised, Superman. Everyone hates him. Meanwhile, back at the battle, the Green Lantern flies in to take out the Mystery Woman, only to have her send his energy back at him in a full feedback pulse, dropping him. She then jumps in, grabbing Jessica Cruz, the power ring, exclaiming that this is the one that she's after, because her evil power is linked to another universe, and she needs those shadows to bring down the one that she is summoning. So she draws the power out of the ring, tapping into the other universe, breaking the sky above everyone, calling to the darkness. And the Anti-Monitor arrives on Earth from the beacon. Back with Superman and Lex, Lena takes out a mother box and sucks everyone into it, and they all go to Apocalypse, just as Scott Free's mother box drops him off in front of Myrina Black, the woman that everyone is looking for. Now that they're on Apocalypse, Lex and Superman realize that this is not somewhere friendly, and they begin walking through the cities. But back on Earth, the battle continues as Wonder Woman jumps in to continue battling against the Mystery Woman. And the Anti-Monitor smashes the ground in front of her, stopping this fight. Wonder Woman looks up at him. What are you? I am desperate. At that moment, Metron appears to our heroes and using his boom tube, he teleports them all the way from the Anti-Monitor and the Mystery Woman. The Anti-Monitor then looks down at the woman. Next, you will bring me your father. And she tells him, Darkseid is already on his way. Mybrina Black brings Mr. Miracle into her base of operations as she explains that she is completing the mission of the Amazons, the one that they forgot, to save the world from war, and she wants his help. She explains that she knew the Dark God was out there, that Darkseid was going to enslave the entire multiverse, so she created a weapon by having his daughter, Grail. She then sent Grail across the multiverse to find the one being capable of defeating Darkseid, and she found him the Anti-Monitor, and she brought him to Earth. Mr. Miracle is in shock. You started this war? Here? Billions will die! War is not free. There's always a cost. And obviously, we don't want the same things as she lunges at him! Mr. Miracle makes a break for it, asking the Mother Box to bring him somewhere with friends, and BOOM! He's gone. Over with Metron of the Justice League, everyone wants to know what's going on, and Hal explains that this is Metron. While he may claim to be a good guy, he's not. I dealt with him recently when the New Gods attacked Oa to try and find a White Lantern ring. And Metron explains that he was only there to observe. He observes all. He has seen the Justice League save the world multiple times. But this is not the time for them to save it. It is time for them to say goodbye to their loved ones. So Wonder Woman throws her lasso on him and demands to know, Who is the Anti-Monitor? And Hal tells her, It won't work. He doesn't have the knowledge. It's in the chair. He's basically plugged into a giant Wikipedia. So she asks again, differently, how do I get my answers? And he tells her, take his chair. So she yanks him off of the chair. The chair begins to teleport itself away, but Batman runs over to it and he sits down. And then all of the power and knowledge of the universe shoots through Batman, connecting him to the chair. He can see all, he can understand all. He knows the answers to everything. So he asks, who killed my parents? Joe Chill, right, I knew that. What's the Joker's true name? No, that's not possible. And then Wonder Woman stops him. Bruce, are you okay? Of course, Diana. I'm a god now. And then he asks another question. Who is the Anti-Monitor? That is the only thing that my Mobius chair doesn't know, he tells the group. And then realizing that he just told him that it was his chair. Everyone tells him to get off before it does any serious damage. And he smiles. I have this under control. Back on Apocalypse, Superman and Lex are trying to figure out why they're there, because Superman's X-ray vision doesn't seem to be working. Then, all of the slaves on the planet begin to attack Lex and Superman, chanting, Death is freedom! Death to Superman! Lex manages to blast them all off of Superman, and then Superman punches the ground, sending them off flying. So Lex looks on in horror as Superman is bleeding. 
The planet isn't near the sun and is depleting Superman's powers fast. Meanwhile, back with the Justice League and the new god of knowledge, Batman, Mr. Miracle boom tubes in and he grabs Wonder Woman's lasso so that he can tell them that he is a friend and he is here to help. He has a new plan to get the Anti-Monitor to leave Earth and he wants everyone's help to do it. He needs them all to come with him. But Batman refuses, saying that he's going into the depths of the multiverse to find the answer to who the Anti-Monitor is and how Jordan tells him that if he's going to space, that's my domain, I'll go with you. Mr. Miracle then chains Metron to a post nearby and everyone heads off for their missions while Metron smiles. Soon, I'll be free. Superman and Lex keep running on the planet Apocalypse, trying to avoid all of the slaves and the parademons until they find themselves boxed in and Superman unable to fly. So Lex Luthor holds his hand out. Take my hand and trust me, Superman. Back on Earth, the heroes appear before Grail, just at the same moment that Darkseid boobs tubes in. Power Ring turns to Wonder Woman. Who do we fight? And Wonder Woman wonders, who is the lesser of these two evils? Over on Apocalypse, Lex Luthor and Superman are flying through the skies using Lex's suit, but the parademons can fly, and Lex isn't fast enough, so he flies over a pit of solar energy, and he drops Superman. The theory is that Superman will be granted his powers again and be able to save them, but as Superman falls through the fires, burning his own skin, Lex realizes that something is wrong. Because Superman rises up, all blacked out shouting, I should have killed you a long time ago, Lex. He is now the God of Strength! Deep in the multiverse, Batman and Hal are traversing it, looking for the origins of the Anti-Monitor, and it brings them to the destroyed Earth-3, the home of the evil Justice League. But this isn't where they stop. They need to go to Quard, the birthplace of the Anti-Monitor. While back on Earth, the Anti-Monitor and Darkseid are slugging it out with such force that everyone is being thrown down. While this is happening, Grail is battling against her brother, Kalibek, and she manages to scar his eyes, and then Wonder Woman leaps in to continue her fight with Grail. But back on Apocalypse, Superman is now hovering over Lex, and then, in one move, kills all of the Parademons. He then hovers over Lex once again, and Lex, with sweat beating down his forehead, is scared. Lex, did you honestly think that you ever stood a chance against me? You've only ever come close because of one reason. He then winds his arm up ready to punch Lex Luthor because I held back. Back on Earth, everyone is trying to stop the Anti-Monitor and Darkseid, but it's all worthless. So the Anti-Monitor enacts his plan and he summons the Black Racer, death itself to the battlefield. During this, Batman and Green Lantern make their way to the planet Quard, the birthplace of the Anti-Monitor. And Batman realizes that the Anti-Monitor came to this planet to seek the forbidden and he became cursed because of it. Free will is at the center of the entire universe and the white light is where everything comes from. Batman and the Green Lantern both stand at the source of all creation, at least where it was until the being known as Mobius unleashed it. Mobius, the man that invented the Mobius chair that Batman is sitting on. The first man to seek out the knowledge of the creation of the universe. Batman then realizes that Darkseid doesn't know the truth. He doesn't know the truth about the anti-life equation, the thing that he's been seeking since its inception. Mobius touched the anti-life equation. That is why he became the Anti-Monitor. While they figure this out, the Anti-Monitor points to the Flash and he turns him into the host of death. The Black Racer becomes the Flash. And then the Anti-Monitor turns the Flash on Darkseid. I know your one weakness, Darkseid. I was changed into this because I held what you wanted and I am bound to it forever. The Anti-Life Equation is in my veins. And then using his power and the speed of the Flash, he kills Darkseid. As Darkseid hits the ground in a pool of his own blood, Wonder Woman begins to hear laughter from the god of laughter, Gelios. Darkseid is dead. But can a god die? Is it true, Motherbox? Mr. Miracle asks. Yes, Darkseid is dead. Scott, you are free. Shazam hovers nearby. Shouldn't we be worried about the fact the Anti-Monitor has up and left with his army? I mean, he didn't even stick around to gloat. Did I do that? The Flash asks, standing nearby looking at his hands. Mr. Miracle looks at him. No, the Black Racer did, Flash. Not you. The Black Racer was Darkseid's ultimate weapon, but it needed to be bound to a host. I'm sorry. Why are you apologizing, Mr. Miracle? Because all of the previous hosts are all... I'm not them. I don't want to escape death. I want to control it! Flash, God of Death! Meanwhile, back at Apocalypse, Superman is floating near Lex Luthor, completely covered in black and white. K-9 
Can you hear it, Luther? I can. Across Apocalypse, the mother boxes are telling their slave masters, and the slave masters are telling the slaves. Ding dong. The witch is dead. And he grabs Lex Luthor by the head, and he begins to lift him off the ground. Superman, the cells from those pits are tearing you apart. You need my help before it destroys you. I don't need your help, Luther. I'm going home. But you? You aren't going anywhere. He then tears Lex Luthor's suit off of him, and he throws him to the ground. Never come back to Earth. Then, Superman, God of Strength, leaves the planet. Lex calls for Superman to wait, but it's too late. He's already left the planet. Over, somewhere else in the multiverse, with Batman and Green Lantern, Batman, the God of Knowledge, informs Green Lantern that the war is over. Darkseid is dead. What about the Anti-Monitor, Bats? He touched the Anti-Life Equation. It turned him into that creature. And now that that is over, I can turn my attention back to what is important. I need to be the Batman that Gotham needs. No, you need to get the hell out of that chair. But as the Green Lantern reaches out for Batman, he feels a shock of pain. Without Darkseid, the Parademons are without their leader. They are roaming free out there in the universe, and they have found the brightest light. Oa, go take care of your colleagues. I'll take care of mine. And with that, Batman, the God of Knowledge, leaves for Earth while Hal goes to discover the journey of the God of Light. Back in Apocalypse, Lex Luthor is stranded and alone. Well... Not alone. As a hook comes flying out of nowhere to capture him, he hits the ground hard, kicking up dirt, mixing it in with his own blood, and a woman in rags walks over with a small army. Stand him up. I am Ardora, the leader of the Forgotten People. Is that supposed to impress me? If you knew us, it would. What do you want with me? Maybe nothing, maybe everything. The blind prophet has written that on the night of Darkseid's death, a human would walk through the ashes of Apocalypse and everything would change. It is written that this human is a great hero from a place called Metropolis and he has saved that world many times and he will bring us hope. Are you this man? Lex Luthor wipes the blood from his mouth and looks up to her. Yes, yes I am. And then she hits him with lightning. Meanwhile, back with the rest of the league, Wonder Woman, Cyborg, Power Ring, and Shazam. Shazam suddenly screams out in pain. The new gods are calling to you! And he rockets into the sky. Shazam, god of gods! With Shazam and Flash gone, Cyborg asks Wonder Woman what they should do next, but they are interrupted by Darkseid's children. Do not worry about them. Father is dead and so are you! Back with Lex Luthor, he wakes up attached to a bunch of machines with the ceiling opening up. They explain that if he is truly the hero that he claims, his test is now as the Omega Effect returns to the planet. It hits Lex Luthor with the full force of the Omega Effect! And he begins to feel this new power entering his body. And he declares, Darkseid is dead. Long live Lex Luthor, God of Apocalypse! Back on Earth, Wonder Woman lunges into battle with the children of Darkseid, and while she's clashing with the biggest of the brutes, Power Ring and Cyborg take on the smaller of them, and then Mr. Miracle tackles Kanto, the leader of the children. Luckily, Big Barda shows up and stabs Kanto through the throat, causing a massive explosion. Steve Trevor asks who she is, and Mr. Miracle explains, Yeah, that's my wife, as she leaps in to help Wonder Woman. Mr. Miracle asks why she's here, and she explains, To end this, they were supposed to be on their honeymoon. But he clarifies, No one can know we're together if Granny and the Furies find out. But Barda stops him and gives him a passionate kiss, which makes even Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor uncomfortable. Barda then asks Darkseid's children why they fight. Darkseid is dead. And they state that while he is dead, they live on and they will do this for him, for Kalibek! And once they finish here, they will find the Anti-Monitor and finish him as well. Back on the Rock of Eternity, Metron, the new god that the Justice League left there chained up, has freed himself and he's wandering through the halls. Without his chair of knowledge which Batman took, he can't get out of this mystical place. And as he walks through, the woman in the mirror, someone who speaks to Billy Batson, sees him and asks him if he traded the safety of the universe for his own soul. Because if Mobius, also known as the Anti-Monitor, gets his chair back, the universe is doomed. He smashes the mirror, demanding quiet. Over with Wonder Woman, she explains her plan. She is guessing that the crime syndicate from Earth 3 might know what is going on. Superwoman, Ultraman, and Owlman have been on this Earth ever since they attempted to invade and defeated the Justice League, only to be defeated by Lex Luthor. This was an event known as Forever Evil, but Wonder Woman thinks that they may know what the Anti-Monitor is doing because they fled their world as he destroyed it. Steve Trevor explains that this is a problem though, because the remaining members of the crime syndicate are being held by Argus as level zero inmates. No one, not even the Justice League, can see them. Mr. Miracle stops him right there. 
he can get Wonder Woman and the remaining members of the League into the secure location. So Wonder Woman decides that since they can't even reach the Justice League, she'll go get them herself. So they jump through Cyborg's boom tube, and Steve Trevor asks Diana why she's worried. He's never seen her worried, and she explains it because an Amazon started all of this. An Amazon that she has never seen, nor has she even heard of. One that carried Darkseid's baby, and used it to start this war. This caused the League to split apart and turn into gods. She doesn't worry often, but she also doesn't get cold often, and today she is both. And that's when Superman, the god of strength, appears behind them and lifts Steve Trevor up. Am I interrupting? Meanwhile, Batman, the god of knowledge, is looking for the Joker. Just as the Anti-Monitor finishes whatever he's doing with an explosion, the Flash is trying to outrun death. As the ball of power leaves the Anti-Monitor, Shazam is coping with his new powers. Once the ball grows closer to Grail, the daughter of the Amazon Diana spoke of. Green Lantern is getting closer to Gotham to save Batman from himself. Back at Grail, she reaches out for the ball. The Anti-Life Equation! Lex Luthor is accepting his role as the god of apocalypse. And as all of this is happening, Grail becomes the goddess of the anti-life. During the Dark Side War Act 1, Anti-Monitor turned Barry Allen into the host for the Black Racer, the entity of death. With his mission of killing Dark Side over, what's next? Barry stares down at his hands with everyone looking at him. Did I just kill Dark Side? Mr. Miracle looks at him. No, the Black Racer did Flash, not you. The Black Racer is Dark Side's ultimate weapon but it needed to be bound to a host. I'm sorry. Why are you apologizing, Mr. Miracle? Because the previous hosts are all, I'm not them. I don't want to escape death. I want to control it. A ghost of someone close to Barry then appears and he stops. Who? That's the moment that Barry uses to break free from the Black Racer, separating himself from death, and he runs as fast as he can to get away from it. The Black Racer gets hot on his trail, keeping himself within inches of Barry. You are wrong. Everything that has ever lived has exactly the same thought. They are no longer living. You must accept me. No! The Flash shouts, running as fast as he can. Faster than the fastest man alive has ever run. How can the Flash conquer death if even Darkseid couldn't? Death is different to Barry because death was what created the Flash. It killed his mother, which drove him to become the Flash. It means something to him. At that moment, the Black Racer catches up and throws the Flash to the ground, where he can see himself in front of his mother's tombstone. And then death appears before him. Take my hand, Barry. Unless you accept death, the entire universe as you know it will end. Look now and tell me what you see. The Flash looks over what appears to be Central City. And then he shows Barry life. Then Barry sees himself running after the Black Racer as he approaches the innocents to kill them. And he stops and he destroys death. Then all of the people around him die, decaying in front of him. This is the future, Barry. Do you see it? You are not a man. Not anymore. You are a god! And Barry sat down, allowing the tears to flow from his eyes. Everyone I've ever known, ever fought for will die, no matter what I do. Yes, life is brief and precious and beautiful because of this. The Black Racer must run. It has to happen for the universe to continue, or it will break and all life will end. You must take one life, Barry, or there will be no lives to save. He then appears in front of Iris. I thought of you, Iris. Why did I think of you? She turns around surprised. Flash? There's no way to explain this, Iris. I've become the Black Racer, the Grim Reaper. I'm the one that people will see just before they die. She walks over and wipes a tear from his face. I can help you, Flash. We can deal with this together. But then something wakes up in the Flash. Oh, Iris. That is why I came for you! He then fills with death and becomes the Black Racer again, taking a swipe at Iris. One life, so the universe can survive. But just as he's about to kill her, he breaks free! No! You still refuse, after I've explained it to you! You'd rather the universe end than take one life? Yes! But I must have a tether! Very well, then if this is your choice, perhaps I can use Daniel West instead. Or maybe Gorilla Grodd. Do you think that he would enjoy wielding such power? Defeated, the Flash thinks again. One life? Yes! Okay, you got it. I'm gonna kill the Black Racer. What?! The Flash then wields the Black Racer's scythe. This is your weapon, so I'm thinking it can kill you. No, you can't do that! The Flash chases the Black Racer until he catches up to a terrified Black Racer and he kills him! Finally triumphant, the Flash runs to the Salt Flats, where he realizes he didn't stop anything. 
He just released death because it no longer has a tether. He then watches as the entire universe dies. And that's when the Flash realizes what he has to do. One life has to end to save everyone that he cares about. And one life has already ended. It ended a long time ago. Back in actual reality, the Flash stands before the Justice League still. All of this has happened in his mind in the last couple of seconds. The Speed Force and the power of death combined. I am the Black Racer, now and forever. And that is the Flash's tie-in to the Dark Side War. Batman sits in his chair over Jim Gordon, looking down on him while they are both standing on the roof of the GCPD. Jim, why do you use the bat signal? It's a relic of the past. We don't need it anymore. Felt like shining it one last time before we melted it down into scrap. By your tone, I can tell that you are not embracing my change. Do not fear, as your concerns are unwarranted. What I have since you've been in that damn chair is an overworked justice system. We can't hold the amount of perps you're bringing in. There is no legislation for what people might do. There is no might. Like the man who sat in this chair before me, I can see what was and what is. I am plugged into people's thoughts throughout this city, and I am able to alter the timeline to prevent actions from occurring. Alter it, huh? Make all the damn boo-boos all better? I'm saving lives by striking preemptively, and that's all that matters. Does your chair come from a world where there's no more crime, no more murder, no more wars? It doesn't. Then you're kidding yourself into thinking that change is going to come. But at that moment, Batman gets a ping from his chair, and he is gone. I still hate when he does that. He appears in front of a car full of individuals with weapons ready to do some really bad things. And then, BOOM! He warps them all to the Antarctic. Since the GCPD can't do anything about people that haven't actually committed their crimes yet, Batman will punish them in his own way. And he leaves them there, because as he puts it, it's plenty of time for them to rethink their actions as they wait for the Navy ship to draw near. Then, BOOM! He warps back to Gotham where he appears in front of a man that was intending to possibly kill his ex-wife. He then warps him to the island of the Amazons to get a proper punishment for a man that enjoys beating on women. Then, Batman decides that it's time to help himself, and he boom tubes to the moment that his parents died. He tries to catch the bullet, but he can't change the past, only watch it. He then stares at Joe Chill, the man that murdered his parents, and demands that the chair bring him to Joe Chill right now. He boom tubes into Joe Chill's cell, and he knocks out his cellmate before cornering Joe Chill against the wall. Joe tries to call for the guards, but Batman puts up a sight and sound shield, preventing anyone from hearing what's going on. He demands to know what it's like living behind bars. Does he feel that he deserves better? Does he feel that he is beyond this? He then boom tubes Joe Chill to the alley where he killed the Waynes, and Joe tells him, Yeah, I did it. I killed those blue bloods right here in this alley 20 years ago. That night, I had the power of life and death. And I'm probably that little boy's boogeyman right now. I'll bet you were. As a matter of fact, I'm sure of it, Batman tells him. Yeah, waking up screaming for his mommy and his daddy, seeing their eyes roll white as they gurgled on their guts. So Batman gets into Joe Chill's face. I'm particularly interested in the bodies from this night. Oh, why is that? Because I'm Bruce Wayne, he shouts, removing his mask. Not possible. It can't be. Little boys grow up. I should have killed you that night! Your first words is that you should have fired a gun into a child's face at point-blank range? Hearing you say that makes me want to blast you with an energy blast from this chair. But I have a better idea. What if I spread rumors around this prison? Just a few words whispered into the heads of the prisoners. Joe Chill created the Batman! B -b 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 please you can't! You won't! What do you think the odds of you screaming for your mommy and daddy when the big bad wolves come knocking? What kind of monster are you? I'm not a monster, Joseph. I'm your boogeyman! For God's sake, where is everyone? Batman reaches down and he grabs Joe Chill by the face. Forget everything that we spoke about. You don't know who Batman is and you never will. Then, boom! Batman is gone. And Joe Chill is exhausted and has no idea what has just happened. Batman went back to the Batcave where Alfred asked him to please step off the chair and eat something. But Batman explained that his chair provides. He has no need for sleep or food any longer. Alfred comments on the fact that Bruce is bleeding, and it might be time to get off and actually eat and drink like a normal human, but Bruce explains that he is bleeding because the chair is pushing back. It doesn't like someone who's as proactive as he is. But this chair, it's a gift. But Alfred interrupts him. It's a curse that is enticing you, sir. I can get off at any time I want, Alfred. Is that so, sir? So Batman tries, and he finds that it isn't that easy. The chair won't just let him walk away, so he stops trying. Enough! 
If remaining in this chair allows me to be the perfect Batman 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then so be it. An absolute Batman dealing absolute justice. And thanks to this chair, I will be able to narrow my focus from the many to the one. And that is Batman's tie-in issue to the Dark Side War. What about the other guys? Superman, Shazam, Green Lantern, Lex Luthor, The Flash. The mother box stands in front of Jon Stewart. Will you be my god? Jon puts out his last distress call as the pair of demons stomp him into the ground. Hell, this is it. I've got nothing left. This is me dying. Here's my final message. The mother box grows even closer. I ask again, Green Lantern Jon Stewart, will you be my god? As Hal grows closer to Oa, he got Jon's last message. After Darkseid died, his pair of demons attacked Oa. Millions of them! The Green Lantern Corps fought hard, but for every parademon they dropped, ten more appeared, and the Green Lanterns were overwhelmed. Eventually, the parademons made their way to the central power battery, and they took one of the mother boxes and put it into the battery, joining the source of our power with the source of their power. They then took each of the defeated Green Lanterns one by one and they brought them to the battery to ask if they would enter and become God. But we refused. Every Green Lantern told them that we lived as lanterns and we died as lanterns. So they killed us and they turned us into parademons. That's why I left you this message, to let you know that you are the last of us now, Hal. And you'll come back, and you'll fight, and you'll break. And when they ask you, remember who you are. Hal arrived and he began fighting against the parademons, his former friends. So while he removes them as threats non-lethally, he asks the ring, What is a mother box? The ring explains that mother boxes access energy from the source, allowing them all omni-knowledge and the ability to understand everything and anything. They also provide telepathy, teleportation, energy manipulation, and energy transference. They also tie themselves to users and are loyal to them, like a ring. So Darkseid has a mother box that controls all of these parademons, and then he dies. So the mother box looks for someone as strong as he is. It senses the central power battery and it goes for it, but it learns that the power of the battery isn't conscious, and the mother box needs a new master, a new god. Hal fights as many of the parademons as he can, but it's a pointless endeavor. But it does give him time to remember the loss of his own father. He lost his dad in a plane crash, and he always wondered, why would God allow this? Why would God kill his dad? Why would God just watch him die? But his father's friend explained that Hal was right. God did watch him die, because God's got no choice but to watch. He had to let it happen, because there's one thing that makes God different from everyone. God doesn't have free will. Everything God does is a necessity, and it has to be. His father's friend explains that we don't go to church to worship God. God comes to church to worship us, because we get to choose what we do. So the parademons finally beat Hal Jordan, and they carry him to the mother box, and it asks him, Will you be my God? You know, I can really see why the other fellas turned you down. We've all been trained not to exceed our authority. I was never one for the cautious. You want a god? My name is Hal Jordan, and my father cut the sky open. With that, the mother box accepts him, and it begins to change him. Fill him with power! Envelop him! And Batman knows exactly what is happening. He sees all as the god of knowledge, and he knows Jordan is about to see the true purpose of the Justice League. Hal admits he finally understands. He can see everything. He understands everything. He is the god of light! First thing he does is ask the mother ring. Can he return things to the way they were before the attack? And the Mother Ring replies, You are now a god, Hal Jordan. Just say the word. Ping. And in an instant, there are 7,200 Green Lanterns, 10 Guardians, and zero Parademons on the planet. And one god. The Ring explains that he is no longer bound by time and space. He is light. He is everywhere. Hal Jordan then falls to his knees. I don't know what to do. He remembers back to the night in the church with his friend's father, and he appears there. He actually arrives at that time, and he hears the speech again about how God had to watch his father die because God has no free will. He thinks on this. No free will. He has to watch everything now. So he asks, Mother Ring, can you destroy yourself and bring me home? Just say the word, Hal Jordan. Ping. The planet returns to its state before the attack, along with Hal Jordan returning to his previous state, the ring tells him that there are now 2,701 lanterns, 10 guardians, no demons, no gods. And Hal takes off into space telling himself he should have done it, but he couldn't. Why couldn't he be a god? And his ring answers him, gods have no free will. You are Green Lantern of Sector 2814.1, and you are not willing to give that up. Yeah, okay, now set a course for Gotham on Earth. 
When I wore the Mother Ring, I saw what Batman was going to do with that Mobius chair, and no one deserves that much pain. And while en route, let's see if we can cut the sky open. He now stands in a crater in the middle of Philadelphia, stunned as new beings are trying to speak in his head, trying to command him, tell him where to go. But one voice breaks through, the wizard that granted Billy his powers originally. Batson, listen to me! The old Pantheon is gone! Pantheon? What does that even mean? Wizard, you're alive? I tried to help you, to find new gods! But I was a fool! One! Zonus, if you set him free, he'll savage the universe! Billy is very confused and he looks at his hands and he realizes that one of them is on fire. And one of the gods inside of his head tells him, This is my gift to the power of Shazam. The gods continue to argue within Shazam about the strength of his powers. What's a gift? Who's trying to hurt him? So as confused as he's ever been, Billy leaps into the air to fly away. And he can't. He hits the ground confused even further and one of the other gods tells him, The powers of Shazam have been redefined. He tells all of the voices to shut up! He can't think! And they tell him that if he wants them to shut up, just say the word. So he shouts, SHUT! And he's gone in a bolt of lightning. He appears in a garden, and a voice tells him that he has reached the source, where all things come in return. The goddess Annapel steps forward and explains, while the wizard grants Billy the title of Shazam, it is the gods that the deal is struck with, and Annapel is one of the new pantheon that makes up Shazam. The shockwave from Darkseid's death disrupted the connection to the gods, and in a desperate attempt to not leave Shazam powerless, the wizard struck new deals with new gods. But before he could finish, Billy asks, Who is Zanus? He is something terrible, an ancient and putrid force, the first to wield the torment sanction, and the original god of evil. When he was finally defeated, he was sent back to the source as all gods are, but he hopes to use the power of Shazam to escape from the source once again. While you are our boy, Billy, and unable to withstand him, we are gods and we hope to help you. Billy then vanishes and he stands in front of Savath, the dancer of destruction, and the god that grants Billy his strength now. Savath explains that the gods intercepted Billy mid-lightning crack, and when he goes back he'll be right in the middle of the fight with the wizard and Zunus. They need to prepare him for his return. The god Savath calls him weak, so Billy snaps at him, and this impresses Savath, so he sends Billy to his next goddess. Her name is Eight, the goddess of impulse, and she explains that he needs to keep Zanus from getting the staff. If he can, he can win, but if Zanus gets the staff, all hope is lost. Then in another crack, Billy is at the next god, Homaner, the god of fire, art, and death. Billy asks if he's going to tell him what he needs to do also, but the god refuses and tells him that he'll tell him what Billy is. Shazam is a vessel for the might of the gods. Billy is lucky to be that vessel, but he is not essential. They are only with him until he fails, and then he forfeits his gifts. But Billy tells him, Really? A vessel? That's what we're gonna go with? You better rethink what I am. And in a crack, he goes to the next god. But there is no next god. It is the wizard battling against Zanus. Zanus demands the staff, but the wizard gives him a defining no. And then he takes a massive blast from Zanus, throwing him to the ground. Billy sees him and he asks if he's okay, but the wizard tells him not to concern himself with him. Don't let Zanus take the staff. Stop him! Billy looks up at Zanus and asks, Who is that? But Zanus yells out, I am Zanus, but like my son, I chose a different name. Yuga Khan, father of Darkseid! He holds the staff up and he declares that he has the power of four gods to bolster his own. And with this might, He'll punch a hole through the source itself to reclaim his son's throne, raise the earth, and deface it with volcanic sores. Billy looks up in shock. Darkseid? Oh my god, it's not over. You'll never reach earth, never! And Yuga Khan hits him with the power of the staff and then begins to fly towards the hole in the source. But that's when behind him he hears a young boy. You're not going anywhere. You don't know the first thing about Shazam! Your plan was over before it started. And then Yuga takes a swing at Shazam. So Shazam dodges it. He then punches the sword as Yuga throws it down on him. And then, with the lightning of Shazam, he punches it with his other fist, breaking the sword to pieces. Shazam then leaps into the beast of a god, and he shouts, Shazam! Bringing his magical lightning to the ground. He then turns back to Billy, but Yuga is defeated, and the wizard steps forward. He thanks Billy for saving him and getting the staff back, and then explains that the fifth god is him. The wizard himself is Billy's lightning. 
And the sixth god to complete Shazam's powers is Yuga Khan. His might will be enslaved for all of eternity as a penance for the eternity of sin. Then they walk towards the portal together and Billy tells the wizard, so old gods, new tricks? What's next for Magic's champion? The true battle begins for the brand new Shazam! Back in Metropolis, people are beginning to wonder where Superman went. No one knows where he is because he is currently in space fighting against an alien on his way back home. He hits the alien hard, sending it into Earth's orbit, and the creature lands in the Daily Planet, taking out a wall as Superman lands on his chest, covered in black and white. People begin to question if that's really Superman. How can it be if he looks like that? And he punches the suit of armor and rips the alien out. He then puts him down. You are not worthy to fight Superman. And he walks away. The alien calls out to him. Oh, come back and say that to my face, you big ape. Superman ignores the alien and he leaves him there as he flies off stating, I'm hungry. He goes to Melvin's diner where he super speeds to the counter and he demands apple pie. The diner owner Melvin walks over and he tries to make conversation with Superman. You know, I don't know about this new look Superman. Remember when I shaved my beard? The cops arrested me for opening my own diner. They didn't know it was me. You feel me? Superman glares at him. Why would I? I'm not like you. I didn't mean anything by it. I thought, I said give me pie! Superman shouts, slamming his fist on the counter. But as the alien left the planet, he's released a black goo and it's begun spreading through the city. So Jimmy Olsen rides his bike to the diner where he walks in and he asks Superman, what's wrong with him? Superman half ignores Jimmy. I'm fine, Jimmy. Better than fine. Something's wrong with you! So Superman throws Jimmy out the window! Outside, the goo gets closer and closer to Jimmy and he begs for Superman to help, but Superman ignores him. Superman, Metropolis needs you! Why should I care about Metropolis? I've been recharged by the most powerful solar energy in existence, and it's given me clarity, Jimmy. No matter what happens here, I'm not human. It does matter! I'm your friend and I can help! Superman steps outside on that note. Help, help, help. It's all I hear. Why can't you help yourselves? Do you know how much time I've wasted saving this planet only to have to do it again a few days later? It's an endless cycle. One that I finally have broken. What happened to you? I know the real you is still in there. You came to this diner because of Glenda. She swirls your froth in your coffee and shapes it like the symbol on your chest. You came here because of Melvin, because he treats you like every other customer in the diner. He makes you feel normal. I'm not normal, Jimmy. As the goop begins to take Jimmy, he tells Superman, You hear more than the cry for help. You also hear our joyous laughter. You hear our adoration for you. In our hearts, you hear our love for you. Human or not, it doesn't matter as long as you're here. You'll never be alone. Superman lifts off the ground looking at the goop taking over Metropolis and he cocks his head as he considers what Jimmy just said. He lets the goop take the city and then he looks over it and sees nothing moving for miles until a pigeon lands on his shoulder except for you. Then the pigeon leaves and he begs it to stay. At that moment the real Superman pokes through this god of strength and he realizes he doesn't want to be alone. He floats over the city and using his freeze breath he freezes all of the black goo in the city and then he punches it freeing all of Metropolis. Jimmy looks at Superman, the god of strength, and he realizes his friend is still in there. And realizing that he needs help, Superman leaves for space again. And our tale of the Dark Side War continues. Dark Side is dead. Long live Lex Luthor. A long time ago, Lex fell into a well and was all alone at the bottom. He called out for help. But only his father came to him and explained that he brought Lex on this trip to teach him how to be a man. Only the weak ask for help. The strong find a way to succeed. After his transformation, our door leads Lex to a hill to show him what this was all about. Why they need a leader. She shows him the now free people who have lived their entire lives under the oppressive thumb of Darkseid as slaves. And here I am, Lex tells her. So what exactly is it you want me to do? She explains that while Darkseid is dead, there are still those that enforce his rule. With the power of Omega running through Lex's veins, they will free as many as they can. While she doesn't believe in his power, there are many who will. So Lex turns to her. Then why do I need you if the rest of them will follow me? He charges up some of his new Omega powers and our door shouts for him to stop. He is unstable, but it's too late. He explodes. She walks over to see him dangling over the fire pits and tells him, but he is a very angry man. You have no idea. She tells him to let go of his anger, that she can help him if he just lets go. She explains that reaching out for help isn't a sign of weakness. For a proud man like him, it's a sign of strength. Lex thinks back to one of his first meetings with Superman, when his plane was crash landing and Superman was offering his help. Superman flew next to him, offering his hand in aid. 
but Lex refused, and he let go of the plane, plummeting to the waters down below. He will never need help. He tells Ardora, only the weak need help. She tells him to reach out before it's too late, but he begins to fall into the fires, telling her that he can't. He can't do it. Even with him telling her that, she reaches down for him and she begins to fall into the pits with him. Let go of your past, Lex. Let go of all the anger. She falls in with him and they both begin to fall towards the fires down below. You are about to die for me. Why? Because I believe in hope, Lex. Then, with those words ringing in Lex's ears, he gains control of the Omega Power inside of him and he flies the two of them out of the pit. He lands and he asks her how she did that. She explains. She didn't. He needed to open himself up to her and to it. The power of the Omega doesn't judge him. It simply wants to know who he really is. The first step to tearing down the walls was accepting her help. Gods need not be alone. I will stand beside you, Lex Luthor, and so will your army. He looks up to see every parademon looking down on him, ready to do whatever he bids. Batman tells him, I'm never leaving this chair. And Hal asks him, how did you know I was going to ask that? I could read your mind, Jordan. This chair has equipped me with the knowledge needed to save Gotham. So why did my ring find you here? In Ace Chemicals? What is this place? This is where the Joker. Something's wrong. Superman. He's in trouble? He is the trouble. Meanwhile, over with Wonder Woman, she is battling against Superman, the god of strength, ever since he was overpowered by the fire pits of Apocalypse. He blasts her into a car, demanding that she fight him properly. She refuses, putting her sword away. And then she runs at him, jumping over him, getting her lasso around him. You need my help, my patience, my love. No, I don't! While this is happening, Cyborg, Jessica Cruz, and Mr. Miracle are preparing to break into Belle Reve, the prison, to free the crime syndicate. The evil versions of the Justice League from Earth-3. They've been confined to Belle Reve ever since they were stomped during the Forever Evil event. The crime syndicate fought the Anti-Monitor before, and the Justice League was hoping that they could help them defeat this threat. So while Mr. Miracle's wife, Barda, is distracting the guards, Mr. Miracle breaks into Ultraman's cell to ask him, what does the Anti-Monitor want? Why is he here? And Ultraman tells him, to kill every last one of us. Elsewhere, Grail, the woman who started everything, the daughter of Darkseid and an Amazon, is now the wielder of the Anti-Life Equation. And she's devising her own plan, and she's going to need Steve Trevor for it. Back at Belle Reve, Jessica and Cyborg are trying to free Superwoman when Jessica's ring begins to go crazy. You see, she isn't wielding a Green Lantern ring. She is wielding the power ring of Earth-3, the one that contains the soul of Voltham, and he has the ability to take control of its user, which he does, taking over Jessica Cruz's body, trapping her soul within the ring. And he informs Cyborg that he is returning, since the crime syndicate is now reunited. Back with Wonder Woman, she asks Superman, Who are you? While holding him down with the lasso of truth. I'm Superman! Who are you? I'm... Clark Kent, he says, fighting against the power. At that moment, Batman and the Green Lantern arrive, and Wonder Woman informs them that Superman is beginning to remember himself. But Batman tells them his cells are breaking down from that fire pit energy. He may be himself again, but he's far from fine. He's dying. Back at Bell Reeve, Power Ring blasts the cell door open, freeing Superwoman, and she tells him, shh as she holds her pregnant belly. The baby is trying to sleep, but Cyborg isn't about to let Power Ring take over Jessica Cruz, so he tries to hack into the ring, only to have it backfire, and it begins to hack into his own brain. It traps Victor Stone inside of the ring alongside Jessica Cruz, allowing Grid, another member of the crime syndicate, to take over his body again. Then, the wall explodes, with Owlman telling them that they need the Justice League if they're going to stop this threat, because the worst is still yet to come. After the Anti-Monitor defeated Darkseid, he sealed himself in a cocoon to separate himself from the anti-life equation. That's how Grail got her hands on the anti-life equation, turning himself back into the being that he was before all of this. Mobius, the original owner of the chair of knowledge that Batman is currently sitting on. And Mobius wants his chair. Without much hesitation, Superman delivers the kryptonite to Ultraman, allowing him to power back up. The crime syndicate has no intention of saving this Earth. They don't care about it, but they do want revenge against Mobius for destroying their Earth. Owlman agrees that at the end of this, they'll give back Jessica Cruz and Cyborg, as the two individuals are now fully controlled by Power Ring and Grid. But they have to win this battle. They head off, saving individuals caught in the blast of the anti-life equation's explosions that Mobius can control as he frees creatures to attack the citizens. Meanwhile, Hal Jordan and Power Ring begin to open fire 
fire with their constructs because it's decided if Mobius gets in his chair, everyone is going to have some real problems soon. Luckily, Hal has already thought about asking for help and the Green Lantern Corps arrives, blasting Mobius. He is in a pushover though as he causes another explosion, wiping out dozens of Green Lanterns. Jon Stewart lands side by side with Hal and they keep trying to help, but that's when Superwoman and Wonder Woman throw their lassos on Mobius in an attempt to hold him down. While this is going on, Grail returns holding the anti-life equation itself as she took it when the anti-monitor separated from it, becoming Mobius again. And she grabs Steve Trevor, who is currently at the battlefield. Back with the fight though, Ultraman and Superman fly in, slamming Mobius with everything they have as the Amazons were thrown aside. But Mobius grabs Ultraman, burying his hands into his chest. Ultraman calls out for help from Flash, God of Death, standing nearby. But Flash tells him, I can't stop death. I can't even move. And Ultraman turns into dust as he dies. Mobius tells everyone, that was satisfying. Who's next? Behind everyone, there is a boom! As a boom tube is opened and there stands Lex Luthor, the new dark side, the god of apocalypse, with his army of parademons. Back with Wonder Woman, she looks over at a pregnant Superwoman and Superwoman informs Diana that the baby is coming. Meanwhile, the Green Lanterns and Power Ring are tearing apart the dark creatures, attacking everyone and Jessica Cruz is trying to call out for help from inside the ring that she is trapped in, but no one can hear her. Inside of this ring is every soul that Voltham has consumed. The spirits that Voltham keeps in there tell her that she can never leave. He'll punish us when he comes back if you leave. But that's when she hears a voice. One telling her that if she wants to save everyone, she needs to run for the power battery. And looking up, she sees a light. Her escape from this place. While in a separate location where Grail has brought Steve Trevor, she walks forward, kissing him, transferring the anti-life equation into him. Jessica runs and runs with the spirits of both of them trapped, trying to hold her back until she reaches the central battery. And it is there that she sees the voice calling out to her. Victor Stone, Cyborg Soul. Wonder Woman tells the rest of the crime syndicate that they need to move Superwoman away from Mobius because she's giving birth and Owlman tells Wonder Woman to get out of the way. The entire point of everything was for this baby. Meanwhile, Lex Luthor is tearing into Mobius with the powers of Apocalypse and Wonder Woman asks what's going on as Batman floats over in his chair to tell her that he knows. The chair knows. That's why Mobius wants it back to learn what the secret weapon that Owlman is referring to is. It's the baby. On that note, Power Ring blasts both Batman and Wonder Woman away and Owlman kneels down to Superwoman telling her that he needs the baby. Mobius and Lex continue to slug it out, buildings falling down all around them, destruction all over. But Mobius then begins to use his demon creatures to attack Lex directly for him. Seeing everything failing, Mr. Miracle and Barda try to come up with a new plan, but Barda knows what she has to do. She tells Scott that she loves him, and then boom tubes away. Back in the fight, Superman runs into the battle, full of the fire pit energy that is tearing him apart. But he has a better idea than trying to slug it out with Mobius, and he expels all of the energy into Mobius' face. It slightly hurt Mobius, but not as much as it hurt Superman, and he falls. Then Mobius runs at Lex while the Flash waits for death to arrive. Mobius shoves Lex into a car, crushing it. And then another boom tube goes off and Grail returns with her mother and her new pet. Then there's a scream on the battlefield and Hal Jordan can't help but ask Batman, what is it now? And then he tells him, it's a boy. As Superwoman is holding her child, Mobius looks over and he sees Grail's pet, Steve Trevor, imbued with the power of the anti-life equation. Steve begs Diana to help him, and then he unleashes everything onto Mobius, killing him. Everyone looks back in shock as the battlefield once again changes, with everyone about to fight Steve Trevor. Steve Trevor jumps in to fight against the League, the Corps, and Mr. Miracle with a chain around his neck as Grail is still his master. He literally can't control himself as the power of the anti-life equation is firing off random hitting his friends as he begs Diana for help. She tells him to pull through it. She knows that he can. He's stronger than this. And then Grail jumps on Batman's chair. He tries to tell her, you've won. You killed your father. Why do you thirst for this power? And then Shazam throws her off of Batman's chair and all of the Green Lanterns try to contain her in a cage. But she breaks out of the construct, shouting, I will not be caged. She smirks, looking back at Wonder Woman. Are you enjoying yourself? And as Wonder Woman is battling against her former lover, he's begging for her to put him down. He knows that he can't contain this power. Lex Luthor jumps in grabbing the chain, telling Wonder Woman to do it. Kill this man! But Superman grabs him. No, Lex. The League never kills. You are naive, Superman. I have the power of the Omega Effect. I will save this world myself. And as he shouts, there's an explosion of power! Superwoman, meanwhile, holds up her child and says the magical words. Mazass! Shazam backwards. And the magical word used by Alexander Luther of Earth-3 to change into his version of Shazam. Mazass! And then at a stunning turn of events, the baby sucks the power of the Omega Effect out 
out of Lex Luthor, becoming a baby dark side, only to have his mother turn into dust as Steve Trevor blasts her with the anti-life equation, killing her. Grell walks over to the baby dark side and picks him up, holding him into the sky, stating the word Mazash at the Flash. While the power of death is not absorbed, it did separate the Black Racer from the Flash, turning him back into Barry Allen finally. The Black Racer looks around confused and then he realizes that he still needs to take someone's life as he's no longer bound to the Flash. And he begins to chase after the Flash. Meanwhile, inside of the Power Rings ring, Victor Stone and Jessica Cruz are trying to figure out how to get out of the ring. And Vic has finally figured out how to hack the ring. With the fear that she's been suffering finally gone, Jessica tells Vic to send her back. She can fight her fears. And she takes over her body just in time to get into the Flash's path as the Black Racer is about to grab him and take his soul, allowing the Black Racer to take her life instead of the Flash's. She hits the ground dead, and Barry is in shock. But the Black Racer says, A life has been taken! And he leaves the area. Barry kneels down to hold Jessica close, and Wonder Woman tells everyone that they need to end this. But Grail tells them, Today, she is the God Killer! Today, all of your gods will die! And Superman asks her, Gods? We were never gods! As the entire League and the entire core leap in to fight against her, she jumps and dodges, and then decides that she'll take the anti-life equation back, pointing her magic-stealing baby at Steve Trevor. But with the power of all of the gods and the anti-life equation inside of the baby, Darkseid is reborn. While he is reborn, he is still a slave to Grail, and she demands that he incinerate the League. Everyone throws everything at him, but he ignores everything and keeps using his Omega Beams on everyone there. Batman reaches down into his chair looking for answers, but it hurts him more and more as he seeks deeper and deeper answers. And that's when Hal Jordan has an idea. Batman, you just need a little bit of willpower to get off of that chair. And he throws his ring to Batman, who puts it on, and using the willpower that the ring is granting him, pulls himself off of the chair, freeing himself finally from the hold the chair had on him. As Grail walks over to a normal Hal Jordan to finish him off, Barda and the Furies boom tube onto the planet to begin battling against Grail. They refuse to let her desecrate their Lord Darkseid. And while they fight against Grail, Hal helps Batman up, asking what was the chair's answer to Darkseid? Owlman steps over, taking the chair and telling Grid, release Cyborg so that you can download into the chair and join me. Then, Owlman and Grid leave the battlefield as the only two members of the crime syndicate left. Meanwhile, Wonder Woman and Grail's own mother battle it out with Grail because Grail's mother didn't want this, while everyone else is fighting against Darkseid. At that time, Batman shouts out, Diana, the chair told me that the anti-life equation is causing all of this. We have to separate it from Darkseid to disperse all of his energy. So Diana and Grail's mother tie down Grail with their lassos, and her mother holds her close, telling her, let go of your rage. Unleash your rage through me. So Grail opens her eyes, letting her own Omega beams fire through her mother and into Darkseid, separating him from the anti-life equation. The explosion is massive and everyone is thrown aside, but Darkseid is defeated. Steve apologizes to Diana for everything that he just did and everyone looks at Jessica, their fallen friend. How comments how in the end, she wasn't powering, she was a Green Lantern. And that's when a ring lifts up and it announces, Jessica Cruz of Earth, you have the ability to overcome great fear. You have been chosen. Welcome to the Green Lantern Corps. You see, the soul that was taken by the Black Racer wasn't Jessica's, it was Voltham's, the soul that controlled the power ring, freeing Jessica from the grasp that he had on her. Mr. Miracle went over to Barda, his wife, to ask her what now, but she agreed to lead the Furies if they helped her, and now she has to return to Apocalypse, away from him. Grail also wasn't defeated, as she did escape with the baby, the baby dark side. Superman's cells were permanently damaged, and he got news that he never thought he'd hear. He's dying, but that's a story that we're going to cover soon. And lastly, Hal went to see Batman to ask what the chair said about the Joker. And Batman tells him, the ring didn't know who I was talking about, since there are apparently three Jokers. And that is the conclusion to Dark Side War. Now, there is an epilogue, where Owlman finds Metron on the moon. And while they do talk about what was summoned with this explosive amount of power, something out of the multiverse kills them. As Grail, the daughter of the mighty Darkseid fights, she thinks to herself about what is it that she is doing. Her father's plans are vast and glorious in their simplicity, but also in their complexity. There is much for them to do, but the only flaw holding them back is that Darkseid is currently in the body of a six-year-old. He feeds off the energy of Zeus by draining it from the old god's children who are still here on Earth, whether Zeus's children like it or not. Grail slashes at Perseus with her spear, absorbing his strength into the mother box for her father, thinking how the god has lost his edge, and with it, his life. As the energy is taken from him, Grail looks down at Perseus' body, stating that that was fun, and Darkseid tells her, This isn't for your enjoyment. It is about me returning to my proper age. You are just a conduit in the matter. You will do best to remember that. 
Percy's Pegasus flies off and Grail says that they could probably get some energy out of that. But Darkseid stops her, stating that chasing that thing through the sky would be foolish. They came for the god's energy. Now hand over the mother box. It is time to feed. As Grail hands the box over to Darkseid, the energy from it begins to surge out and into Darkseid. After a flash of light, Darkseid stands back up asking, How old do I look? And Grail tells him that he's aged, but only a few years, not nearly enough. Darkseid tells her that she lacks patience, just like your mother. However, unlike your two brothers, you are at least not a disappointment. It is now time for us to go. There is a new legend of ancient Greece that you must face. It is time that we fought Hercules. Just three months prior in the snowy mountains, Grail quickly learned that she had no idea what she was doing. After losing Darkseid to Batman, he was reverted to a child, and they had to find a place to hide. You see, her father was killed during the Dark Side War. But, being a new god, he was reborn into a little baby after the battle with the Justice League. What was she supposed to do with her father as a baby? She is his daughter, not his mother. How could she raise and teach him? Will he grow to be the feared, hollowed greatness that he once was? What if her parenting makes him lesser in some way? As Grail thinks to herself, she can hear one thing from the baby Dark Side. Hunger! She heads back inside asking what is it that he needs. Surely not the normal things a child needs. And Darkseid shouts again in her mind. Darkseid me, God knew, old God. Girl says yes, of course she understands. Let the hunt begin. To allow Darkseid to age properly, he must consume the old gods. And just then, Grail noticed a presence looming over them, a threat that is close by. Seconds later, an attack plane begins to shoot into the cottage, and soldiers begin to fly in shortly. Grail quickly grabs her spear, knowing what she wants to do. Kill everyone. Not that it's a problem, just more people to kill. Grail cuts through some of the soldiers before her, and then leaps into the air, stabbing into the cockpit of one of the attack planes. She jumps back down and the plane loses control, crashing into another, and then she charges back into the cottage to clean up the soldiers all still standing there. As she does, one soldier aims his gun at the baby Darkseid, and Grail calls out for her father. Baby Darkseid stares at the soldier and then releases an energy blast, burning away the soldier's upper half. After destroying the rest of the cottage, Grail picks up her father and leaves, having the seed planted in her for what she should do next. Collect the life force of the gods, restore her father to his former glory, and to do so, she would have to slay Zeus's spawn that continued to walk the earth. One by one, Grail hunted and killed the gods, taking their energy and feeding it to her father. Now, back in the current time, Darkseid is of the age of 12, and he asks Grail if she likes the view here. She looks off the cliff at a small harbor village and says that she likes it well enough, but she knows that he only finds true beauty in battle. He tells her, Look again. Our next target is down there, but this one is special. His name is Jason. Grail stops and asks, Wonder Woman's brother? I only half believed my mother when she told me of, but Darkseid cuts Grail off asking, Are you questioning me? However, there is a greater role for Jason ahead, and it will not be fighting either of us. There are certain opponents that this bright young man will know sooner than he'd like. In the Paris Catacomb, Steve Trevor leads the Odd Fellows into the position to support Wonder Woman on a recent sighting of Darkseid's parademons. As the group turns the corner, Diana cuts through another parademon, asking Steve what took him so long. And he calls back to his team, stating that they heard her. Spread out and shoot him down. However, four hours earlier, at Argus Central Command, Dr. Pearl reveals why Diana and Steve would be heading into the catacombs. Pearl uncovers a body, but not just any body, the dead body of Hercules. Pearl goes on stating that since Darkseid last fought the Justice League, Argus has been monitoring for energy spikes on the planet. Those spikes have been determined to be unique to Apocalypse. Diana says that she understands that, but what does this have to do with her brother Hercules? Pearl then says that Hercules' body and the surrounding area where he was located was rife with that energy. And then she opens up the door to the next room, telling them that the site of Hercules' demise wasn't the first location, nor is he the first victim. All of these bodies have been found with the energy of Apocalypse, which is why they wanted to inform Diana. She then mentions that perhaps they should get more information from the lawyer, Blake Hooper. Currently, she has an appointment with, but before Diana can finish, Nicholson says they have another hit, this time in Paris. And back in the current times, where our story began, Diana rams into a group of parademons with Steve telling her that, you know, a lesser man might feel threatened by how often you have to rescue me. Diana doesn't break stride, continuing to take down more parademons, stating that she's sure that he'll save her when the time comes. He usually does. As the last of the parademons fall, Steve says that he still doesn't get it. There's no link between this hive and the death of Hercules. Maybe our only lead is the lawyer. 
Diana tells him that as the executor of Hercules' will, he has to know something. Let us finish up here and find out what that is. Hercules must have made her his heir for some reason. If you're wondering what's going on, in our last video, we got word that Hercules had died and he left everything to Diana. We've also covered two single issues explaining what happened to Darkseid and Diana's brother. A short while later, over in Oregon, Diana sits in a car with Blake telling him that she could have flown, you know. And Blake takes a sip of his tea, telling her that he believes that it was Nelson Mandela who said dignity above all else. And if he hadn't, he should have. Diana asks Blake how often does he get clients like this, and Blake laughs, stating that he can say without hesitation that this is a one-off. This isn't to state that he hasn't had his fair share of freakish and the depraved, but that just comes from hanging his shingle in Hollywood. Once Diana and Blake pull up to Hercules' cottage, they walk inside and Blake says that she looks a bit sad. She looks around and says that seeing Hercules' home, his life, here and now, he was more than just a legend, he was her brother. She has heard troubling stories about him. Depending on who you ask, Hercules was either a hero or a violent maniac. However, the fact remains that they both have the same father, Zeus. Blake says that Zeus was a great lover of women, and Diana tells him that she's not sure love had much to do with it. He did certainly father many children, some uniquely empowered, some immortal, and some died without ever knowing the truth. Simply put, he may have been a great god, but he was a terrible father. Blake asks what makes her so sure about that, and Diana sighs, stating that, let's just say that she has her doubts that she'll ever be proven wrong. After a few moments of silence, Blake pulls out an envelope and hands it to Diana, stating that he was instructed to give this to her once they got here at the cottage. She opens up the letter and begins reading the last letter her brother ever wrote. He said that he took pride in watching her life unfold, whereas his life was filled with shame. But there was one thing that he must inform her of. There was a man named Gallicus that he rode alongside on the Argo, who was also immortal. Gallicus was given a boy to raise named after the Argonite's leader, Jason. He is her twin brother, just as he is her brother. Diana shouts, stating that she has another brother. She thought that Minrina, the mother of Grail, was lying. She even looked, but with nothing to go on, she got distracted. Blake tells her that that happens, but continue reading. She goes back to the letter, and at the end of it, Hercules says to look onto the Neiman lion that he killed. There will be something of use there. Diana picks up the mantle and sees something scribbled onto it. Something that looks like map coordinates, and they lead Diana and Blake to the Aegean coast. And from there, the two begin asking around. They stop by a restaurant, and Diana asks a waitress about a young man named Jason. The waitress says, actually, there is a fisherman who has a crew. Every morning, they leave before dawn. But if she wants him now, he'll be out at sea. Soon, Diana and Blake begin to walk along the shore, and Blake says that it looks like they're going to have to wait. But Diana takes off her coat, asking, does she look like someone who likes to wait? And she flies off into the sky. She looks around, finding a single boat, and as she gets closer, she sees a man and says that she can feel it. There is nothing wrong. She is his. But before she can finish, Jason looks up at his sister, stating, Sister, I can feel it too. You finally found me. Diana begins to touch down, and Jason says Wonder Woman is his sister, and as Diana lands, she tells him, it's Diana, please just say her name, she wants to hear him say her name. Jason hugs her, stating her name, and says that every time he saw her on the news, she looked amazing. All the good she's been doing, he prayed one day that they would be together. She pulls back, asking if he knew of her, why didn't he contact her? And he tells her it's because he couldn't. He swore an oath to the man who raised him. But come, there is much that they have to talk about. He then begins to fly up, and Diana quickly follows behind as they head towards an old island fortress. As the two land, she goes on stating that she doesn't understand. She understands taking an oath, but she is his! Jason says that she should know that Gallicus not only told her who his mother was, but who his real father was. And not only that, also how vengeful his father's wife Hera could be to those like them. Diana then asks him, how do they do this? It could take some people years to get to know each other. And Jason tells her, one moment at a time. But at least he can say that he's happy that she didn't get his nose. Diana says perhaps, but she is also quite a bit taller. The two spend the day talking about their lives all the way up until the sun begins to set. And as that sun goes down, Jason asks, shouldn't we be getting back now? Diana tells him that they will contact Steve and see if Argus has uncovered any new. But Jason interrupts her telling her, the appointed time has arrived. Diana asks, what does he mean? And Jason's tone changes as he tells her, it means Wonder Woman, that all of this talk has just been a facade. Just like when I lured the fishermen. It means that you are nothing but a stranger to me, and I have done fine without you. All we share is the same blood, but there is someone else that I feel I have much more kinship to. Just then a boom tube opens and Grail jumps out, punching into Diana. Her body flies into the ruins, and as she gets up, she says that she must confess. She hoped to be fighting her alongside her brother. Jason then charges at Diana, shouting, Instead, she'll be fighting against me! She catches the punch and tells him that she doesn't know why he's doing this, but... And Jason yells over her, asking, How naive are you? I hate you. The very thought of your existence. I can't bear to look at you. With one heavy throw, she tosses Jason out into the sea, stating, Then get out of my sight! 
Grail fires back in with an Omega Beam, asking, is that anger that I'm detecting? Did Jason just break your heart? Diana flies up to Grail, grabbing her by the throat and slamming her into the ground, shouting, you have been killing Zeus's children. It ends now. The force from the hit breaks a chunk of the island off, and as Diana pulls herself back up, she asks, which of you wants to fight now? She looks around and sees Jason creating a giant tsunami, yelling that their father was the god of the sky. By controlling the air pressure, he could create this. The water crashes down, knocking Diana into the rocks. And as she lays, Grail jumps in, stabbing Diana in the shoulder. Jason walks up, stating that he thought that this would be much harder. And Grail says that she is also disappointed. Diana asks him if he's really going to allow this, let this disgusting witch kill his only sister. And Jason tells her, no, they're not going to kill her. You're needed, but don't worry. When that time comes, I will be the one to do it. A short while later, Diana begins to open up her eyes, and Jason asks, What is that look? You almost look bored. Diana tells him that she is not bored. Honestly, she can't decide how she feels. Sadness, anger, disappointment, plenty of all three. Grail asks, Won't you shut her up already? And Diana then yells, Listen to me, think! This witch has been murdering the children of Zeus, all of whom, despite never meeting them, were our half-brothers and sisters. Even Hercules, who you claim is your friend and teacher, does that not matter at all? Grail runs up, punching Diana, shouting, I told you to be quiet! Jason tells her, wait, I'm still trying to process all of this. Grail said that she would drain our siblings' energy, bleed them, but not to the point where they would die. Diana scoffs, stating, you've been lied to. And Grail says, things did not go as expected. That's not the same. Diana then asks, if this was all an accident that you killed them, who are you trying to fool? Jason, surely you are not that gullible. Jason yells, I said I was trying to understand all of this. First I was alone and now suddenly I'm not. Danny yells at him, telling him to stop looking for people to blame. This is all on you. You spent so long hiding from Hera's jealousy that it just turned into you hiding. I came here with my heart filled with love and you turned on me and now here I am captive and yet you still haven't explained why. Still, I would do anything for you. Grail punches Diana again, telling her, How about you try shutting your mouth? Diana snaps back, stating, I am done being your punching bag. And Grail asks, What? Suddenly have the power to break free? Diana's wrists begin to shake, and as the restraints shatter, she says, I have always had it. I just wanted to reason with Jason. But now you're both going down. The second Diana is free, she kicks Jason back and then quickly grabs Grail, throwing her into Jason as he tries to jump back into the fight. Once Jason and Grail get back up, they both charge straight at Diana. But as she runs towards them, she is hit in the back with a pair of Omega Beams and a voice that says, I told you both, she cannot die. Diana lifts her head up and says, of course, Darkseid. Darkseid asks, why are you so shocked? You knew that I was resurrected. Diana struggles getting back up, stating that she doubts the fact that he is now a young man would have mellowed him out. He certainly won't be happy when she beats him. Darkseid calmly tells her, It took the combined might of the Justice League to fight me. Now you're all alone and outnumbered. Diana picks herself back up, lunging at Darkseid, but Darkseid backhands her to the ground, asking, What don't you understand? What chance do you possibly have? As blood begins to drip from her mouth, she says that there is one thing that her mother taught her. And Jason, you'll do well to listen. That no matter what, one must always hope. Darkseid hits Diana again with another set of Omega Beams, and Diana shouts, I would much rather die than live in a world where you three triumph. Darkseid tells her, I'm not going to kill you, nor do I need your subservience. All I need is your life force. He holds out his hand and lightning strikes Diana as her life force is being absorbed into Darkseid. Jason watches, remembering what brief time he had spent with Diana, and he shouts for Darkseid to wait. Grail pulls Jason back, whispering to him that Diana doesn't love him. It's her world that lies. And then Blake appears telling everyone that that is enough. Do you hear? That is enough. Diana starts to get up and looks over, asking, The lawyer, why are you here? And Blake smiles, asking, Surprised? Good. Because I love to keep you people guessing. I sensed what you have been doing, and I should have acted sooner. I felt compelled to follow my initial oath to remove myself. Let the mortal and the god alike make their own mistakes. It was with Hercules' death that I realized that I should have at least a taste of this foul stench that has been cooked. Dennis says that he can't be who she thinks he is. And Blake then says, You may have corrupted my son, but as for Diana, release my daughter at once. Lightning strikes down onto Blake, and as the smoke glares, Zeus steps forward, stating, Or you shall face the wrath of Zeus. 
Dana tries to get back up, stating that she doesn't believe it, and Zeus tells her, Yes, it is I. It has always been. But we will talk when I am done with this base creature. Zeus and Darkseid charge at each other, and Jason asks if it's really him. Is it really their father? Diana shouts to Zeus to wait, but Zeus tells her, No! You are still a weak. Plus, it's been too long since I faced a foe worthy of me. Zeus swings forward, and Darkseid ducks, shooting an Omega Blast that curves around, hitting Zeus from behind. He stops, stating, I've encountered quarrelsome satyrs with more bite. He then punches Darkseid with an almighty force of lightning. Darkseid is thrown from one side of the island to the other, and he gets back up shouting, I have fought planets, slaughtered entire armies. You will need more than fists of lightning, old god. As the two clash, Jason says that he can't do anything yet. He's still weak from the tidal wave that he... And Diana stops him, telling him it's okay. Darkseid's power is weakening, and her strength is returning. She will help their father. As Diana gets ready to join the fight, Grail tackles her from behind, shouting that they are not done. Grail goes to bring her axe down, and Diana catches the corner of it with her vambresses, asking, What is it that you're planning on doing? Before Grail can push down, Jason rushes back in, pushing Grail off, freeing Diana. Grail takes the butt of her axe, cracking Jason in the head with it, asking, Haven't you realized? You will never stop my father once he sits on the throne of Apocalypse! Diana gets up, flying towards the fight, and Jason grabs Grail before she can attack again, telling Diana, I'll deal with Grail. Back at the fight, Darkseid stands up after his attack, telling Zeus, The flow of this battle is shifting. I can feel the fire. The boom tube opens, and Zeus jumps at Darkseid, knocking them both through the portal, asking, Why are you running? If you're a coward and leaving, we shall both go! The boom tube starts to close, and Diana flies into it, with Grail running in as Jason tries to pull her back. However, as the portal closes, all five are gone. In the flash of light, Diana looks around, realizing that they are now in the Philippines, in a heavy populated area. Zeus and Darkseid are already destroying as much as they can. Darkseid punches into Zeus, asking, Do you think that my plan is to regenerate through your children? That would be too simple. Yes, they have helped me get to the age that I am now, but that was never the goal. Not even was my daughter. Diana shoots by, knocking Darkseid away, and Darkseid asks, Do you know why I chose to come here? There are people here, lives to save, so get to it! He releases another blast into a nearby building, and as it starts to fall, Diana says that she knew it. He knew that she would save lives before fighting him. Zeus gets up, grabbing Darkseid with both arms, telling him, That is enough! It is time that we showed the world that even a god can die. As lightning begins to course through Darkseid, he manages to reach out, grabbing Zeus by the head, telling him, That's what I've been saying since your daughter showed up. Killing your children, it aged me. It gave me power, but not nearly what I needed. They were bait, a lure. It was you who was the prize all along, Zeus. Zeus tries to remain in control, but the longer that Darkseid keeps his hold, the more power begins to fade from Zeus. A bolt of lightning strikes, and in a flash of light, Darkseid is standing over Zeus's body, shouting, I am Darkseid again! Diana flies on, yelling, If my father is dead, I swear that you will follow him down to the sticks. Darkseid tells her, Zeus is definitely wherever the old gods go. As for you, you were never able to defeat me before. As he trails off, the rest of the Justice League appear behind Diana, and Darkseid says, Speak of the devil, as you humans say. Though I would be delighted to test out my newly regained powers, my goals are too great to risk now. Grail, come! A boom tube opens and both Darkseid and Grail walk through it, but as Diana jumps after them, the portal closes before she can reach them. The League tries to comfort Diana, but all she can think of is how... If they didn't show up, she would have defeated Darkseid. She alone could have. She could have saved her father. As Diana goes to pick up the crumbling body of Zeus, Jason says that he's so sorry that he betrayed her. Prejudging and condemning her when they haven't even met, he is a fool. Diana gets up telling him that if he hadn't done all that he did, none of this would have happened. Jason says that he knows he is the one to blame. Whatever he can do to, she stops him telling him no. Enough. I am sorry too. And as the two hug, Jason says, but my father is... And Diana tells him no. Our father. On the burning planet of Apocalypse, there have been wars about who will be the next to sit on Darkseid's throne after the Darkseid War resolved with his death. But while the battle of supremacy rages on, life goes on in the city of Metropolis. A group of robbers, all wearing superhero masks, calling themselves the Justice League of Armed Robbery, have just struck and they begin to make their escape. However, before they can get too far, two shadows fly over the getaway van and the robbers see real heroes, Superman and Lex Luthor. Lex smiles at Superman, please be my guest. And Superman tells him, no, after you. You were the one who got here first, after all. Lex laughs, ha <laughs> ha, very well. 
Then he grabs a fire hydrant while Superman swoops down grabbing a lamp post. Before the robbers have a chance to react, Superman and Lex throw the fire hydrant and the lamp post into the front of the van, causing it to come screeching to a halt. They jump out and they open fire on Superman. And Superman asks, seriously? You do know melting guns out of an idiot's hand is a hobby of mine, right? He begins to fire his heat vision into their weapons and Lex says, that's for him. Melting idiot's brains is more my thing. Lex shocks the men as Superman shouts to him and Lex tells him, Don't worry, I'm just being a tad dramatic. They were set to taser levels. Shortly after the police arrive, the two heroes go their separate ways, and as Lex flies off to his office building, he thinks to himself that some people were worried about him wearing the S on his chest. However, now he has become a hero to these people, a guardian born of the same planet as the people who walk it. Their love and need for him continues to grow by the day. And then there's a loud BOOM as a cage forms around Lex's face. The Prophet and Adora, citizens of Apocalypse, state that a glorious age is about to begin. They have missed their god of Apocalypse, and it is time for him to to fulfill his destiny. With that, there's another loud BOOM and the three disappear through a boom tube. Back over with Superman, he whistles as he flies into his apartment, noticing that John is getting ready to go out, and he asks him, where are you going, son? John tells him that he was gonna go do some super stuff with Damien, and Superman tells him that he's thinking that maybe they should go hit a movie and grab some dinner. Come on, it'll be fun. John tells him, okay, but only if I can go out superheroing tomorrow night. And Superman tells him, deal. Lois then calls out that she'll pick the movie and they can pick dinner. And at the same time, Superman says Italian, but John says Chinese. Superman laughs and pulls out a coin stating, fine, we'll flip for it. And as he tosses the coin, him and John begin to hear ringing voices in their heads. The voice says that if they can hear this, Superman is needed. Please meet on the Southeast LexCorp balcony immediately. Lois gets up from her desk asking what's wrong, and Superman says that it was a message from Lex. John was able to hear it because the frequency was directed at Kryptonians in Metropolis. Superman continues getting dressed, stating that they're still going to go out as a family. Lex has been sending out these signals for weeks. Last time, it was to show off his chest shield. I'm pretty sure it's nothing. It can wait until I've taken my family out for the night. Later, after seeing their movie, Superman, Lois, and John all begin walking home talking about their favorite scenes when suddenly, a group of Lexbots appears before them. A recording of Lex says, There is no need to fear. This hologram is pre-recorded. Seeing as you ignored my previous transmission, these Lexbots are here to escort you, forcefully if needed, to the location requested. Will you follow the directive and come peacefully? Superman tells the Lexbots that whatever he's gotten himself into, he knows that he can't leave Metropolis. And the Lexbot tells him to please reply with yes or no only. Superman takes off his glasses, simply stating, no. And the Lexbox says that he has responded in a negative tone, which leaves him no choice. Both Superman and John begin to take off their jackets, and Superman says, ready, kiddo? And John tells him, you bet! As they begin to finish changing, they begin to take down the Lexbots with ease, working together as father and son. And just as the last one falls, a small cube appears. And Superman says that he's starting to think that Lex's invitation earlier was more of a command. The cube begins to fold open, creating a giant cage, and then the box is shut, trapping Superman, Lois, and John inside. Superman tells Lois and John that this thing is communicating with a mother box, which means that they're gonna take off any second. Suddenly, there's a loud BOOM, and the box begins to spark and light up. Inside, the energy begins to reach out, grabbing onto the three of them, and in a flash, the three find themselves all separated, each alone at a different part of Apocalypse. Lois hides as she hears the sounds of people passing, and in front of her is Granny and the Furies, a tribe of women who are firm believers that Darkseid himself still lives and will once again rule. As Granny passes, Lois begins to step out of the shadows to move, and then she's suddenly hit in the back of the head, with everything going black. Elsewhere, Lex tells the Forgotten People that he is in a rather forgiving mood, so he'll dismiss them for ripping him from his homeworld against his will. Ardor tells him that their extreme measure will not be taken lightly. Lord Luther, chaos rules and his iron will is needed. Lex says that the children of Earth are weaker than all of you here. They must have constant care and leadership, and Ardor yells, as do they. You made a promise to us and we expect you to honor your sacred words. You are the embodiment of the prophecy. I will sacrifice my own blood if it means that you take the throne. Lex looks out at the balcony stating that he will not be spilling their blood today. He was thinking of spilling his own blood. Now draw your sword. Ardor holds out her sword and as Lex grabs the blade, he pulls his hand down creating a cut. And then he asks, does the scripture state that your God bleeds? The prophet tells him no. The chosen one is impervious. And Lex then says, do I look impervious? And the prophet tells him no. 
The prophet then begins to recite the scripture, stating that the hero would come rescue them, and he would be born of earth and come from the city of Metropolis. He was an orphan, a humble son of farmers. He will be a seeker of truth and the embodiment of justice. Lex tells him, that is right, but I am not that man. Ardora and the others begin to ready their swords, all shouting that the false god will have his head spiked on a rampart for all to see. Lex begins to back away, telling them that he understands their anger, but he has brought them their true salvation. Suddenly, there's a booming sound and Superman appears, with Lex kneeling before him, telling them, Behold! This is Superman, the true god of apocalypse. Back with Lois, she begins to open up her eyes, and one of the Furies, Harriet, says, Greetings! Follow us, yes? You are now a prisoner of the female Furies, and you will be enslaved. Behind them, another of the Furies, named Lashina, cracks her whip on the chained slaves, and Lois asks, What is going on here? Lashina cracks her whip again, hitting Lois, telling her, Be quiet. And Lois glares back with Lashina, telling her, that determined look. I will enjoy breaking your spirit. Granny then calls out that they must move. Darkseid awaits their care and attention. Another fury pushes Lois, telling her to move. But before they can start walking, there's a tremor. And a giant dredge worm bursts out of the ground. Granny shouts that this one must be lost. These worms usually strike in groups. The worm releases a wave of molten bile that begins to burn anyone that it touches, including the slave that Lois is chained to. The blast then also knocks the fury that pushed Lois down, causing her to drop her gun. Lois grabs the gun and begins to shoot at the worm, and the fury gets back up on her feet, tackling Lois, telling her, No one touches my weapon! Just as the Fury gets ready to shoot Lois, the Worm sends out another blast, burning the Fury where she stands. Lois grabs the gun again, shooting her chains, and she goes back to firing at the Worm. Most of the gun's fire has no effect, but Lois tells everyone to aim for the eyes, and soon everyone concentrates their fire on just that. Eventually, the gunfire hits its mark, shooting out the Worm's eyes, and it falls to the ground defeated. While everyone stops to catch their breath, Granny looks at the body of the fallen Fury and takes her armor, telling Lois, You have earned this. You have the heart of a fury. Later that night, the Furies feast on the meat of the dredge worm, and Lois stands alone looking out across the land. Granny walks up, eating a shank of meat from her sword, telling Lois, You fought well today. You were relentless. The Furies are orphans. Family. Now eat with us. Also remember, nothing is more important than family. Lois takes a chunk of meat biting into it, telling her that she knows. Elsewhere, John finds himself surrounded by a pack of men riding giant dogs, asking, Can anyone tell me what is going on here and where I am? One of the men shouts, That's going to be you, on a spit, across the nearest fire pit. John tells him, Hang on! Can't we just talk about this? I'm from Earth. But a man shouts, You are food! As the man lifts his axe, John burns the axe out of his hand, and he tells him, No! I'm leaving! John begins to run away from the pack as they chase after him, and he says that he can't believe he's gonna say this, but I would rather be in school right now! A short while later, John checks around and thinks that maybe he finally lost them, as well as losing himself. He then begins to smell something good, like food, and he begins to climb up a hill to see what's being cooked. He looks over the ledge and he sees the people that he just got away from now roasting one of the giant dogs on a spit. Down at the camp, a group of men stand around a pack of chained up dogs, stating that it's wrong for them to do this, but if they don't eat the dogs, then they're gonna starve to death. One of the men raises his blade to the dog, and John tells him that he can't believe that he's actually doing this, and he jumps down into the camp, firing his heat fission. He begins to hit the men, and then he frees the dogs from their chains, telling them to run. But rather than leave, the dogs all turn to their owners and begin to fight with John, until finally John blows them all away. John then looks back at the dog, telling him, it's okay, but there is one more large dog in the cage growling at him. He tells the dog, Please be a good mutant doggy, and don't bite my face off, okay? And he breaks the lock off. The door swings open, and the dog leaps at him, licking his face. The puppies then all run over to the freed dogs. John begins to pet one of the puppies, telling them, I guess now I'm not the only lost pup, huh? Well, if only you guys could sniff out my parents. One of the dogs leaves and returns with a stick, and John grabs it and asks, Does this mean you're gonna help me? He lifts a stick, which is actually a spear, and the dogs howl, as John says, Sweet. Back with Superman, he lifts Lex into the air, telling him, You've gone too far this time. That S is supposed to mean something. And Lex tells him, Yes. And thanks to me, it means something on Apocalypse as well. The people here see it and they think of their true savior. Someone who has come that will bring them hope. I can hardly blame you for wanting to reject this particular burden, but we can't run from this. Superman tells him, I'm not running, but I won't go back until I find my... And Lex asks him, You're what? Did someone else come here with you? Before Lex can finish his question, both Superman and Lex are shot out of the sky and they come crashing down into the ground. Superman checks on Lex and he sees that he's knocked out. Hopefully he can, but then a large hand grabs Superman by the throat asking, HOPE? 
and Kalabak lifts both Superman and Lex, shouting, Hope is anathema on Apocalypse. A short while later, Kalabek orders his men to increase the power of the Chaos Cannon and get ready for the next search party. We're going to reach the planet's core for Darkseid! Kalabek's men state that even Darkseid himself couldn't stand the heat from the planet's core. It's madness to keep firing into the core like this! Kalabek shouts for his men to be quiet and continue. Glory awaits the men who descended to the pits. Just then a flare erupts from the pit and Superman tells Kalabek that he must listen to his men. What you're doing could have disastrous consequences. Another voice calls out that the Furies approach and with them is Lois. Granny then shouts that Kalabek has brought shame upon his house. They are here to restore Darkseid's order. Kalabek yells, I will find my father and... But before he can finish, Granny punches him, telling him, I've heard enough of this nonsense. The two factions begin to clash, and Lois runs over to where Superman is being held and begins to free him. And once free, he shoots over, punching Kalabek, the force which throws him up and over the Chaos Cannon. Kalabek begins to climb up onto the cannon, stating, You are all against me! You all want my father's throne! And if I can't have it, no one can! He pulls the lever on the cannon's power, and it charges up, and it begins to fire into the planet's car. As the hole is punctured into the core of the planet of Apocalypse, the flames of Apocalypse go out, something that was thought to not be possible on this planet. As everyone begins to get up from the massive blast, Kalabek picks Superman up, telling him, The planet core has been vented. My father will be found. No more prophecy. No more Kryptonian. Lois runs up shouting no, and she punches Kalabek and he looks over back at her. Just then there's a howl and everyone turns asking what is that? And along the ridge, a shade of a dog rider appears, and then with them more dogs appear. Kalabek is laughing, stating that there's only one rider, and he himself looks like a pup. All of the dogs begin to charge down, and that lone rider, John, holds his spear shouting, LET MY MOM AND DAD GO! Within seconds, a total war between the tribes of Apocalypse erupts. Kalabek versus the dog packs, Granny versus the parademons, and Superman man versus the Furies. Blows are exchanged between everyone, and in the middle of it, Kalabek and Granny make their way to see who will be the one to rule the throne. A parademon swoops down, grabbing Lex's body, but before it can get far, John and his dogs ride through, attacking that parademon. Harriet lunges for Lois, telling her that she knew that she was never really a Fury. You never had the strength for it. And Lois cracks Harriet in the head with her spear, telling her that she's sorry that she feels that way, and she begins to single-handedly take out the remaining Furies. Superman grabs a parademon, smiling, asking, I never told you how glad I was to see your back, right? And Lois sticks her spear into the parademon, telling him, say it again. Meanwhile, back with Kelebek, he diverts his attention and begins to run through John's dog pack. And he reaches out, grabbing Lex by the leg. He shouts that he will end this now by throwing this man into the abyss. And just as Lex's body is thrown, a hook shoots out, wrapping around his suit, suspending him in the air. Another explosion goes off, knocking Kelebek back from where he stands, and then he falls into the pit, leading to the planet's core. When everyone looks up, they see the forgotten people. And the prophet shouts, All hail, Lord Superman. This pit will be Luther's fate. The judgment is Superman. What say him? Superman looks up and burns the cables holding Lex and then catches him. Another man grabs Granny yelling that she will not escape Superman's judgment. And Granny tells him to just kill her and be done with it. Superman shouts, she lives too. And the prophet asks if that's a wise decision. And Superman tells him, probably not, but it's the right thing to do. Mercy is for those who are in need of it. The prophet begins to tell Superman that mercy is a foreign concept to many of them here. And Ardora says that she must admit it's an alluring concept that she is slightly grasping. The prophet then says that there is no point in fighting the prophecy. It says that Superman will lead Apocalypse. Superman tells them that he has his own world and family to take care of. What they are asking him is... Ardora stops him, telling him that she knows that they are not the first to receive similar justification. But are they also so far beyond any hope? Superman sighs and tells her that she's right. No one, not even those here in Apocalypse, are beyond hope. I accept. And so the mantle of Superman is hung through the halls, and the rooms are filled with chants, Hail Superman! Hail Superman! Superman tells the citizens of Apocalypse that he may not be here, but he will leave behind an ember of liberty and hope so that they all may share the same flame as he does on Earth. He lights a torch and he passes that flame to Lois and John, who then pass the flame to everyone in the halls. There will be no more fighting between the tribes of Apocalypse, and everyone will learn to work with one another so that in their new future, hope will be inextinguishable. Superman then tells Ardora that he has a very solemn duty for her. She must assemble the governors of the regions, and together they must find a way to lead those in need. Ardora says that she is just a soldier, and Superman laughs, stating, Some of the finest leaders are. I know you will do your best. He hands her a small boom tube cube, telling her that this will allow us to remain in contact. 
Rest assured, I will always be there to answer the call. And with that, Superman picks up Lex's body and him, Lois, and John all teleport back to Earth. The next morning, Lex wakes up at his desk, still in his suit, walking out to his balcony looking over Metropolis. He smiles, stating that he is home, and a shadow appears with Superman floating down before him. Lex says, well that's a surprise. You voluntarily came to see me, which is good because there is something I must get off my chest. Whenever the League calls, you answer. A cat is stuck in the tree and you're there, but when I, your so-called partner, is marooned on another planet, you don't even show? Superman begins to speak, but Lex talks over him, yelling, I bled for this city and this blasted S that I wear. How is my sacrifice repaid? With suspicion and disrespect. Superman, who is so rich with mercy for everyone, still refuses to trust me. Superman tells him that it's dangerous to trust a hypocrite. What he did in Apocalypse proves it. Lex then digs his fingers into his chest armor, asking, Dangerous? So be it. He rips the S emblem off his chest, burning it as it falls to the ground. Superman stares at him and then he flies off. Be seeing you soon, Luther. All Lex can do is stand there and laugh as the S burns away on the ground. In the Amazon jungle, the wild and exotic creatures would make calls to each other, and no one would hear. But now, the animals fall silent, knowing that there is something dark looming over them. That that darkness is great. As Darkseid stands over Bernadette and the other female Furies, he says, Your mission was clear. You were to find the relics and bring it to me. The top copy palace had no more power. And yet you have come back empty-handed. And Grail adds, Also with fewer Furies than when you left. We haven't seen much of Darkseid since the Darkseid War in which he was defeated and killed, and his daughter Grail found him as a child, a baby to grow back up. Recently, he's been sapping the powers of the old gods, Zeus and his kin, bringing the power back towards Darkseid, making him whole again. Darkseid continues, That is correct. We're a Lashina and Harriet. Bernadeth tells him that they were expected. Their skilled fighters were laying in wait, and the Fury suffered greatly. Darkseid asks, There are more skilled than my Furies. I fear you are no longer of any use to me. Omega Beams shoot out of his eyes, and they splinter and stop just before obliterating the three Furies. And Darkseid tells them, If I had more forces that were once mine, then you would be no more. But as it is, I have a need for you. This is your last chance. Your next failure will be the end. Darkseid looks over at one of his underlings, asking, You are the leader of these peons. How long until the artifacts are integrated into the temple's energy matrix? Do we, in fact, need to acquire the rest of the relics? The underlings tell him, Well, to answer the second question, no. No matter what, we need all. But before he could finish his sentence, the Omega Beams tear through him, and Darkseid tells him, I dislike hearing no. He points to another underling, telling him, You are now in charge. Work faster and harder. The underling tells him, Yes, yes I will. We all will. Darkseid will rule the Earth. Darkseid walks back into the temple, asking, Is this what I think it's about? I have a good mind to kill you for your stupidity. I care nothing for Earth, now that the mascara is no longer on it. The next night, Diana heads over to the Argus headquarters to see Steve to tell him how she's been. First, she faced off against a pyrokinetic simply named Zara, who had the ability to fire a fierce crimson flame. But their battle was brief after Zara slammed into a wall with her lasso. Next, she fought an attacker that didn't have a name, but people dubbed him the Blue Snowman. However, it was from a snowman, as it was an exoskeleton suit that could control the temperature around it. What people didn't know is that even though they called it a snowman, there was a woman inside who was inside working it. Lastly, Angeletta, the woman who took Angleman's place, wielded the same weapon and created spatial portals and time bricks. But before she was able to capture her, she stepped out of the picture. Steve says, man, that's one hell of a day. But we still don't know who's behind all of this, do we? And Diana tells him that she has an idea. Veronica Kale. But with no solid evidence, there is nothing that they can do for now. Diana then asks, what about him? And Steve says, well, I fought some parademons, which means Darkseid or Grail is somewhere. As the two continue to talk about the situation, Diana hears a voice call back, Sister, I'm back. And Diana spins back to see her twin brother Jason wearing a strange set of armor. Diana asks, what happened to him? Where has he been? He's been missing. What is that armor that he's wearing? And Jason tells her, honestly, I have no idea. Last week, it was like a hazy dream, a dream about giants. Diana asks, what is that supposed to mean? Giants, you've been gone for over a week and that's all you can recall. And Jason tells her, yeah, I know things now. Like I'm able to sense things. I don't know how, I just know I can. Diana smiles and tells him, all right, first let her say how happy she is that he's back. And now, what is it that he knows? Jason begins to explain that this armor was given to him, like a gift, but again, from who he does not know. All he knows is that it was given with love. 
but they both know that that comes with a price. There is something that he is supposed to do. Not now, but soon. Just before Diana could question him further, one of Steve's subordinates runs up stating that a report just came in. It's Grail. She's in Bavaria, Germany. The men are gearing up and it's going to take them time to get out there. Jason begins to float up stating, while they get ready, Diana and him can fly there much faster. With this new armor, it enhances his existing abilities. He can now fly faster than even Diana. She grabs onto Jason's hand and they fly away, with Steve watching stating, sure, I guess we'll see you when we get there. A few more minutes into the flight, Diana notices Jason is rather quiet, and she asks what's wrong. Jason tells her that he was thinking about Grail, and how he wanted to face her. He was a fool to have partnered with her and Darkseid. Then, when he fought against the Deep Six, Grail appeared and saved him. Looking back now, he totally sees that the whole thing was a setup. And Diana tells him that all she can say is that the end result is what's important. Now, Bavaria is right over there. They have work to do. Inside one of the buildings, Grail stands over the Huntsman body, and he asks if this is how it ends. Outside, Diana sees what's happening and asks Jason if he can just throw her as fast as he can. Jason tells her that he has no idea, but let's find out, and he launches Diana through the sky and into Grail before she could land the killing blow to the Huntsman. Jason gets ready to follow, but before he can fly in, he looks around and says, ha <laughs> Of course, anything to do with Apocalypse, and there's always going to be these parademons. Back inside, Diana jumps back away from Grail's attack and quickly throws her shield, narrowly missing her. Grail laughs, stating that she missed, and Diana tells her that that is what she calls misdirection. And within that moment, Diana takes her lasso, wrapping it around Grail. Just a little background story on Grail. She is an Amazon whose father is Darkseid, and she was banished from the island. Dinah pulls the lasso tight, telling her that now she's got her, and asks her what is Darkseid planning. Grail struggles not to talk, but as she grits her teeth, she says, Darkseid wants an army, one better than the Parademons. Diana then asks, what is the importance of the relics then? And Grail says, it's because of their energy. It radiates a specific frequency from a specific time in the past. A time when the new gods were the old gods, who walked a primitive earth with the other pantheons. When science was incorporated within the old new gods temple, father would be able to boom tube using the energy of the Greek pantheon and other important aspects of the mythic past. Diana then asks, what other aspects is she talking about? And Grail tells her, why? The mascara, of course. That's why. But then Grail falls silent. Diana pulls on the lasso asking, why did you stop talking? And Grail says, because she no longer has to answer. All this time she's been concentrating, preparing herself, and now she is ready. Ready to do something only someone with the blood of Apocalypse and an Amazon can do. As Diana begins to wonder, Grail stands up, releasing a blast, knocking Diana and the lasso away. Before Diana can get up though, a boom tube opens and as Grail runs through it, she yells, the next time we meet, you'll die. A short while later, back at the Amazon temple, Grail kneels before her father, Darkseid, telling him, I'm sorry, I have failed. Darkseid tells her, yes, you have. But you've also given me clarity by confirming my lack of options. To quote the humans, it is now do or die. He then looks at one of his underlings and asks, are you sure that we lack the power to breach the mascara with our current relics? The underling says that they are certain. They have tested and retested. Darkseid stops him and asks, what about Argus headquarters in America? And the underling says, well, yes, that is certainly possible. And Darkseid then asks, what are you waiting for then? Later back at the Argus holding cells, Diana holds out her lasso, stating that she will give them one chance to talk. Both Lashina and Harriet remain quiet, and Diana shouts, sisters! And Harriet tells her not to say that. They are not her sisters. Diana tells them, fine, then she shall say it again. Furies! And Harriet laughs, telling her that that's better. Lashina then asks what does she want, and Diana tells her it's simple. From what she's been told, that they have withstood any and all questioning so far. So, this is their one chance to talk. She has discovered some of Darkseid's plan from Grail, but that questioning was interrupted. The lasso could be used, but if they would just tell the truth, it would be faster. Lashina then asks, is this how they do things on their Amazon island? And Diana tells her no, not if they can help it. Just then, the restraints on both Lashina and Harriet spring off, and Diana goes on telling them that happened because she wanted it to happen. Happen. Their weapons are by their feet. Now come and try to withstand questioning now. Back at the Amazon temple, Darkseid asks the underling in charge if everything is ready, and the underling tells him, not yet, but soon. Before he could finish, an Omega Beam fires and bends around, destroying the underling. With Darkseid looking at another one, stating, I will try again. Is everything ready? The next underling says, yes, yes, right away! And Grail says that she does not understand what he is trying to do. They already have a boom tube. What is the point of making it stronger using the relics? Why not just attack Argus? Darkseid tells her that if they attack there before the Justice League shows their faces, they face needless risk to their plan. Better bring the battle to them in the Amazon jungle, a place where the world's heroes don't look. Darkseid then points to another underling asking, are we ready? And the underling tells him yes on his order. 
Darkseid smiles and tells him, Consider it given. Back at Argus headquarters, Diana battles against Lashina and Harriet, seemingly not getting the answers that she wants, and just a few moments into it, there's a loud BOOM from the outside, with Diana punching Harriet, telling her that it seems that she won't get the answers from them. So she'll just ask Darkseid directly. Suddenly, there's a second BOOM, and then a third, and a fourth! Diana radios back, asking what's going on. Is Darkseid here? And Steve tells her there's no sign of him yet, but something is different. Just then, everyone inside the Argus headquarters begins to feel the pull of the boom tube, and suddenly, it's thrown out to the ground. Steve gets up, stating that this is not what he was expecting. Darkseid stole the entire Argus building. Well, the chunk that mattered, at least. Diana looks around, asking, and that's when she sees him. And she shouts, you monster! And Darkseid tells her, yes, here I am. This is it, our final battle, so says Darkseid. Diana walks forward, stating, No quarter was asked, and none shall be given. Diana runs forward using both of her fists. She cracks Darkseid across the head, but Darkseid swats her away, asking, A mere punch. I can recall that you once took an eye of mine. You are slipping. As Diana's body bounces off the wall, Grail shouts to Darkseid to begin their work. She will finish her. As she jumps in, Jason flies through, grabbing her, telling her, That is not gonna happen. And he rockets the two of them out of the temple. Steve calls out to his men that Darkseid literally teleported half their building here. There is no time to help the wounded or count the dead. Pick a target so that they can end this nightmare while he he helps Wonder Woman. She tells him to stay where he is and to fight what's around him. She will be fine. Diana jumps back at Darkseid and he tells her, No, you won't. As Diana gets closer, she moves and focuses on the pillar behind Darkseid, breaking it and sending it crashing down on top of him. He bursts out of the rocks, asking, Do you think mere rubble will stop the mighty Darkseid? Diana leaps back in, punching, asking, if not, how about this? You murdered my father, my brothers, and my sisters. You want pain? Then I will give it to you on behalf of them. But during the fight, Lashina and Harriet grab the relics in Argus's possession, and the underling says, Thank you, darkness. We have what we need now. With everyone's attention set on their targets, the underlings begin to place the relics into the modified boom tube. Diana punches Darkseid once again, but before she could land another hit, Grail jumps in, tackling her to the ground, with Jason flying back, shouting, No! This fight is between! But before he could finish, Lashina and Harriet jump in, latching onto Jason, tearing him to the ground. Darkseid gets to his feet, telling them, Such silly theater tricks! Very well, if you want a show, then you shall have one. He walks towards the boom tube, and as it powers up, he begins to show a place. The Amazon Island, their homeland, the Mascara. Darkseid calls out to Grail, It is done! The portal is open. Diana breaks free from Grail, shouting, No! I must warn everyone! And she attempts to fly through the portal, but she's repelled back. Darkseid tells Grail, You know what must be done. And Grail slides on a gauntlet, telling him, Yes, she is ready. She looks at Diana and then asks if there's anyone that she should give her regards to. Old friends, perhaps. And Diana says, Wait, how is Grail able to enter and she cannot? And Grail laughs, telling her it's because the gods do not permit those who have left the island to return. However, the relics in this gauntlet we've reverse engineered from the new gods of old allow her to use the ancient energy of the island. It lets her, a half Amazon, who for a brief period was there as a baby, who was held in her mother's arms and never acted actually set foot on the island until now. She pushes herself through the portal, and as she steps through, she says, Ah, home sweet home! Some of the Amazon warriors gather, asking who is she? Is she one of their sisters? And she fires a blast into the group, telling them, It doesn't matter who I was from this moment. You will all be dark side servants. Back on the other side of the portal, Diana watches as her Amazonian sisters begin to fly back to the mainland as parademons. As Diana tries to hold off the Amazonian parademon, Steve and his men run in, telling Diana, Let me worry about the flyers. You gotta take care of Darkseid. One of Steve's men begins to run through the crowd, yelling that he has found Wonder Woman's sword. But before he could finish the sentence, one of the Amazonian parademons stabs him in the back, and Jason flies through, grabbing it, shouting, I've got it! As Jason turns and heads towards Diana, he asks, Grail was able to cross because she never actually set foot on the island, right? Well, neither have I. Take the sword! Jason tosses Diana her sword, and he aims straight for the portal. Darkseid fires an Omega Beam at him, yelling, No one will stop my daughter! Jason converts his body into wind, telling him, Ha ha! Nice try! Good luck hitting someone who can literally turn into the wind. Diana charges at Darkseid, cutting into his chest, telling him, You are insane! Transforming my sisters into parademons. This madness has no rhythm at all. On the other side of the portal, Jason sees the Amazons fighting against their transformed sisters, and then he sees his mother, Hippolyta, fighting Grail. He calls out to her, and Grail turns back asking, How? And that's when Hippolyta smacks her with her spear, cracking Grail on the side of the head. Jason flies down to Hippolyta, telling her, I'm your son! 
And Hippolyta tells him that it is her beautiful boy. Finally, she's able to see his face. And Grail looks up stating, oh, how touching. If I had time, I'd vomit. Hippolyta turns, hitting Grail with the end of the spear, telling her, shut your mouth. And back on the other side of the portal, Darkseid punches Diana away, stating, I have said it once before, but because of your persistence, it must be said again. You couldn't defeat me with the Justice League at your side. What chance do you have alone? As Diana is thrown into a wall, Steve runs over asking, is there anything I can do? And Diana tells him no. She's starting to think that he might be right. She might not be able to defeat Darkseid. Steve says, win or lose, do or die. I'm at your side. I believe in you and I love you. Diana pauses for a moment and says, that's it. Love. Hatred won't win this, but love might. She jumps back into the fray, but Darkseid punches her back, telling her, perhaps I should enslave you too. You would make a fine hunger dog. Diana starts getting back up, stating that she is not going to fight him with fists, but with love. Not for him, but for her father and half siblings whom he murdered. The ones who shared her blood, the ones whose energy makes them all connected. Darkseid swings again, but Diana catches the punch, telling him she wants them to know how much she loves them. She wants them to feel her presence. She swipes at his face, but rather than let the blood be drawn, it is light. Darkseid shouts in pain, and as he does, the light pouring out of him begins to get brighter, and all of Diana's half siblings begin to free themselves, coming out of his being. As the last of them comes out, Zeus himself steps out, and he tells Diana, I am proud of you and your brother. Tell him. But before he could finish, his light fades, and Darkseid screams as his body is torn apart from the inside. He has only returned by taking the power of these old gods, and they have been stripped out of him. His body begins to turn to nothingness, and Steve asks what happened. And Diana says that she honestly isn't sure. She thinks Darkseid might actually be dead this time. Steve points back to the portal, telling her, Yeah, we've all heard that before, but the portal's closing and Jason is still on the other side. Back on the island of Themyscira, Jason sets down the last of the Amazonian parademons, telling Hippolyta that that is the last. Hippolyta tells him that she is more worried about him. The portal to Earth is closing. The two look back and Hippolyta goes on stating that after all this time, she's finally able to see him, but right now, he must go while there's still time. Just know that she did what she did in order to protect him. He must believe that. Jason smiles, telling her, of course he does now. She doesn't have to say that she's sorry. He just needed to see her, and that's all he wanted. Hippolyta hands Jason her spear. It was designed by Artemis and crafted by Hephaestus. It's enchanted and unbreakable. It's the only thing that she can give him. Jason tells her that he doesn't need, but Hippolyta pushes it into his hands, telling him that there's no time, he must go, and know that he goes with his mother's love. Back on Earth, Steve and his men finish rounding up the last of the parademons just as the boom tube closes, and Jason flies off, stating that he made it. Diana runs up, stating that she thought she would lose him forever, and Jason tells her that he wouldn't have minded it honestly, but he got to meet his mother, and she told him that she loved him. Diana hugs him, telling him that she saw father too. She's not sure if he's alive or not, but at least he's free of Darkseid. Whatever happened to Grail? Jason tells her that he stopped a couple more of her transformed sisters from getting through, but that's the extent of it. It was her mother that took Grail down. He's going to take a guess that she's now a prisoner of the Amazons. A short while later, Grail opens her eyes, asking what, where. A voice calls out to her, stating that she is in her prison. Until the Amazons deem otherwise. Grail sees a shadowy figure in chains, asking if that's so, then who is he? The man steps out with his eyes glowing red, and he tells her, My name is Ares, God of War. This is my prison. My home too, I should say. I am here because, well, the simplest way to put it is that it was best for everyone. Grail tells him that she is no one's prisoner. Is she supposed to live with him? As what, his concubine? She would never! Ares stops her, telling her, Don't flatter yourself. I have loved and lain with Aphrodite. What would I need with you? At best, the hope is that I will show you the error of your transgressions through discourse, nothing more. Grail stands up shouting that her father will come for her. He will find a way to reach this place. She knows that he's not dead. If he were, she could sense it. She's sure that he's out there. And somewhere on Earth, a man with gray skin looks at his reflection and asks, where am I? Who am I? That is the question, isn't it? Well, time to find the answer to that. And there you have it, the Dark Side War playlist combined into one giant epic. Everyone has been asking what happened to Dark Side War, and I feel like a lot of you lost track of what happened to it, because basically Dark Side War happened and then it seemingly vanished, like all the epilogue stuff came out months later. It wasn't like it came out immediately, like the Superman tie-in or the Wonder Woman stuff. None of that came out immediately. That all came out months later, and then we're all sitting there like, isn't this Dark Side War stuff? And before you ask, we have never found out what happened to Shazam and the New Gods. Uh, I'm pretty sure that DC right now is ignoring that all of that even happened. So I'm letting you know right now, I'm pretty sure the Shazam thing just vanished into thin air. 
Either way, hope you guys enjoyed. And don't forget to subscribe to the Comic Story and channel to get your full massive storylines every Monday right here. See you next time.